This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Jakeway. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 98. The Bell and Bottle Tavern. And now let us leave Mademoiselle Danglars and her friend pursuing their way to Brussels, and return to poor Andrea Cavalcanti, so inopportunely interrupted in his rise to fortune. Notwithstanding his youth, Master Andrea was a very skillful and intelligent boy. We have seen that on the first rumor which reached the salon he had gradually approached the door, and crossing two or three rooms at last disappeared. But we have forgotten to mention one circumstance which nevertheless ought not to be omitted. In one of the rooms he crossed, the trousseau of the bride-elect was on exhibition. There were caskets of diamonds, cashmere shawls, Valenciennes lace, English veilings, and in fact all the tempting things, the bare mention of which makes the hearts of young girls bound with joy, and which is called the corbeil, literally the basket, because wedding gifts were originally brought in such a receptacle. Now, in passing through this room, Andrea proved himself not only to be clever and intelligent, but also provident, for he helped himself to the most valuable of the ornaments before him. Furnished with this plunder, Andrea leaped with a lighter heart from the window, intending to slip through the hands of the gendarmes. Tall and well-proportioned as an ancient gladiator, and muscular as a Spartan, he walked for a quarter of an hour without knowing where to direct his steps, actuated by the sole idea of getting away from the spot where, if he lingered, he knew that he would surely be taken. Having passed through the Rue Montblanc, guided by the instinct which leads thieves always to take the safest path, he found himself at the end of the Rue Lafayette. There he stopped, breathless and panting. He was quite alone. On one side was the vast wilderness of the Saint-Lazare, on the other Paris enshrouded in darkness. Am I to be captured? he cried. No, not if I can use more activity than my enemies. My safety is now a mere question of speed. At this moment he saw a cab at the top of the Faubourg Poissonniere. The dull driver, smoking his pipe, was plodding along toward the limits of the Faubourg St. Denis, where no doubt he ordinarily had his station. Ho, friend, said Benedetto. What do you want, sir? asked the driver. Is your horse tired? Tired? Oh, yes, tired enough. He has done nothing the whole of this blessed day. Four wretched fares and twenty sows over, making in all seven francs, are all that I have earned, and I ought to take ten to the owner. Will you add these twenty francs to the seven you have? With pleasure, sir. Twenty francs are not to be despised. Tell me what I am to do for this. A very easy thing, if your horse isn't tired. I tell you he'll go like the wind, only tell me which way to drive. Toward the Louvre. Ah, I know the way. You get good sweetened rum over there. Exactly so. I merely wish to overtake one of my friends, with whom I am going to hunt tomorrow at Chapelle and Serval. He should have waited for me here with a cabriolet till half past eleven. It is twelve, and tired of waiting, he must have gone on. It is likely. Well, will you try and overtake him? Nothing I should like better. If you do not overtake him before we reach Bourget, you shall have twenty francs, if not before Louvre, thirty. And if we do overtake him? Forty, said Andrea, after a moment's hesitation, at the end of which he remembered that he might safely promise. That's all right, said the man. Hop in and we're off. Whoop la! Andrea got into the cab, which pressed rapidly through the Faubourg St. Denis, along the Faubourg St. Martin, crossed the barrier, and threaded its way through the interminable Villette. They never overtook the chimerical friend, yet Andrea frequently inquired of people on foot whom he passed, and at the inns which were not yet closed, for a green cabriolet and bay horse, and as there are a great many cabriolets to be seen on the road to the low countries, and as nine-tenths of them are green, the inquiries increased at every step. Every one had just seen it pass. It was only five hundred, two hundred, one hundred steps in advance. At length they reached it, but it was not the friend. Once the cab was also passed by a calash rapidly whirled along by two post-horses. Ah, said Cavalcanti to himself, if I only had that Britska, those two good post-horses, and above all the passport that carries them on. And he sighed deeply. The calash contained Mademoiselle Danglars and Mademoiselle d'Armilly. Hurry, hurry, said Andrea, we must overtake him soon. 
and the poor horse resumed the desperate gallop it had kept up since leaving the barrier, and arrived steaming at Louvre. Certainly, said Andrea, I shall not overtake my friend, but I shall kill your horse, therefore I had better stop. Here are thirty francs. I will sleep at the red horse, and will secure a place in the first coach. Good night, friend. And Andrea, after placing six pieces of five francs each in the man's hand, leaped lightly on to the pathway. The cabman joyfully pocketed the sum and turned back on his road to Paris. Andrea pretended to go towards the Red Horse Inn, but after leaning an instant against the door and hearing the last sound of the cab which was disappearing from view, he went on his road and with a lusty stride soon traversed the space of two leagues. Then he rested. He must be near Chapelle in Serval, where he pretended to be going. It was not fatigue that stayed Andrea here. It was that he might form some resolution, adopt some plan. It would be impossible to make use of a diligence, equally so to engage post-horses. To travel either way, a passport was necessary. It was still more impossible to remain in the department of the Ois, one of the most open and strictly guarded in France. This was quite out of the question, especially to a man like Andrea, perfectly conversant with criminal matters. He sat down by the side of the moat, buried his face in his hands, and reflected. Ten minutes after he raised his head, his resolution was made. He threw some dust over the top coat, which he had found time to unhook from the antechamber and button over his ball costume, and going to Chapelle in Serval, he knocked loudly at the door of the only inn in the place. The host opened. My friend, said Andrea, I was coming from Montefontaine to Senlis when my horse, which was a troublesome creature, stumbled and threw me. I must reach Campagne tonight, or I shall cause deep anxiety to my family. Could you let me hire a horse of you? An innkeeper has always a horse to let, whether it be good or bad. The host called the stable boy and ordered him to saddle Whitey. Then he awoke his son, a child of seven years, whom he ordered to ride before the gentleman and bring back the horse. Andrea gave the innkeeper twenty francs, and in taking them from his pocket dropped a visiting card. This belonged to one of his friends at the Café de Paris, so that the innkeeper, picking it up after Andrea had left, was convinced that he had led his horse to the Count of Malone, 25 Rue Saint-Dominique, that being the name and address on the card. Whitey was not a fast animal, but he kept up an easy, steady pace. In three hours and a half, Andrea had traversed the nine leagues which separated him from Campagne, and four o'clock struck as he reached the place where the coaches stop. There is an excellent tavern at Campagne, well remembered by those who have ever been there. Andrea, who had often stayed there in his rides about Paris, recollected the bell and bottle inn. He turned around, saw the sign by the light of a reflected lamp, and having dismissed the child, giving him all the small coin he had about him, he began knocking at the door, very reasonably concluding that having now three or four hours before him he had best fortify himself against the fatigues of the morrow by a sound sleep and a good supper. A waiter opened the door. My friend, said Andrea, I have been dining at St. Jean Abois, and expected to catch the coach which passes by at midnight, but like a fool I have lost my way, and have been walking for the last four hours in the forest. Show me into one of those pretty little rooms which overlook the court, and bring me a cold fowl and a bottle of Bordeaux. The waiter had no suspicions. Andrea spoke with perfect composure. He had a cigar in his mouth, and his hands in the pocket of his top coat. His clothes were fashionably made, his chin smooth, his boots irreproachable. He looked merely as if he had stayed out very late. That was all. While the waiter was preparing his room, the hostess arose. Andrea assumed his most charming smile and asked if he could have number three, which he had occupied on his last stay at Campagne. Unfortunately, number three was engaged by a young man who was traveling with his sister. Andrea appeared in despair, but consoled himself when the hostess assured him that number seven, prepared for him, was situated precisely the same as number three, and while warming his feet and chatting about the last races at Chantilly, he waited until they announced his room to be ready. Andrea had not spoken without cause of the pretty rooms looking out upon the court of the Bell Tavern, which with its triple galleries like those of a theatre, with a jessamine and clematis twining round the light columns, forms one of the prettiest entrances to an inn that you can imagine. The fowl was tender, the wine old, the fire clear and sparkling, and Andrea was surprised to find himself eating with as good an appetite as though nothing had happened. Then he went to bed and almost immediately fell into that deep sleep which is sure to visit men of twenty years of age, even when they are torn with remorse. 
Now, here we are obliged to own that Andrea ought to have felt remorse, but that he did not. This was the plan which had appealed to him to afford the best chance of his security. Before daybreak he would awake, leave the inn after rigorously paying his bill, and reaching the forest, he would, under pretense of making studies in painting, test the hospitality of some peasants, procure himself the dress of a woodcutter and a hatchet, casting off the lion's skin to assume that of the woodman. Then, with his hands covered with dirt, his hair darkened by means of a leaden comb, his complexion embrowned with a preparation for which one of his old comrades had given him the recipe, he intended, by following the wooded districts, to reach the nearest frontier, walking by night and sleeping in the day in the forests and quarries, and only entering inhabited regions to buy a loaf from time to time. Once past the frontier, Andrea proposed making money of his diamonds, and by uniting the proceeds to ten banknotes he always carried about with him in case of accident, he would then find himself possessor of about fifty thousand livres, which he philosophically considered as no very deplorable condition after all. Moreover, he reckoned much on the interest of the danglars to hush up the rumor of their own misadventures. These were the reasons which, added to the fatigue, caused Andrea to sleep so soundly. In order that he might awaken early, he did not close the shutters, but contented himself with bolting the door and placing on the table an unclasped and long-pointed knife, whose temper he well knew, and which was never absent from him. About seven in the morning, Andrea was awakened by a ray of sunlight which played warm and brilliant upon his face. In all well-organized brains, the predominating idea, and there always is one, is sure to be the last thought before sleeping, and the first upon waking in the morning. Andrea had scarcely opened his eyes when his predominating idea presented itself, and whispered in his ear that he had slept too long. He jumped out of bed and ran to the window. A gendarme was crossing the court. A gendarme is one of the most striking objects in the world, even to a man void of uneasiness. But for one who has a timid conscience, and with good cause, too, the yellow, blue, and white uniform is really very alarming. Why is that gendarme there? asked Andrea of himself. Then, all at once, he replied, with that logic which the reader has doubtless remarked in him, There is nothing astonishing in seeing a gendarme at an inn. Instead of being astonished, let me dress myself. And the youth dressed himself with a facility his valet de chambre had failed to rob him of during the two months of fashionable life he had led in Paris. Now then, said Andrea, while dressing himself, I'll wait till he leaves, and then I'll slip away. And saying this, Andrea, who had now put on his boots and cravat, stole gently to the window, and a second time lifted up the muslin curtain. Not only was the first gendarme still there, but the young man now perceived a second yellow, blue, and white uniform at the foot of the staircase, the only one by which he could descend, while a third on horseback, holding a musket in his fist, was posted as a sentinel at the great street door which alone afforded the means of egress. The appearance of the third gendarme settled the matter, for a crowd of curious loungers was extended before him, effectually blocking the entrance to the hotel. "'They're after me,' was Andrea's first thought. "'The devil!' A pallor overspread the young man's forehead, and he looked around him with anxiety. His room, like all those on the same floor, had but one outlet to the gallery in the sight of everybody. "'I am lost,' was his second thought, and indeed, for a man in Andrea's situation, an arrest meant the assizes, trial, and death, death without mercy or delay. For a moment he convulsively pressed his head within his hands, and during that brief period he became nearly mad with terror but soon a ray of hope glimmered in the multitude of thoughts which bewildered his mind, and a faint smile played upon his white lips and pallid cheeks. He looked around and saw the objects of his search upon the chimney-piece. They were a pen, ink, and paper. With forced composure, he dipped the pen in the ink and wrote the following lines upon a sheet of paper. I have no money to pay my bill, but I am not a dishonest man. I leave behind me as a pledge this pen, worth ten times the amount. I shall be excused for leaving at daybreak, for I was ashamed. He then drew the pen from his cravat and placed it on the paper. This done, instead of leaving the door fastened, he drew back the bolts and even placed the door ajar, as though he had left the room, forgetting to close it, and slipping into the chimney like a man accustomed to that kind of gymnastic exercise. Having effaced the marks of his feet upon the floor, he commenced climbing the only opening which afforded him the means of escape. At this precise time, the first gendarme Andrea had noticed walked upstairs, 
preceded by the commissary of police and supported by the second gendarme who guarded the staircase and was himself reinforced by the one stationed at the door. Andrea was indebted for this visit to the following circumstances. At daybreak, the telegraphs were set at work in all directions, and almost immediately the authorities in every district had exerted their utmost endeavors to arrest the murderer of Caderousse. Campagne, that royal residence and fortified town, is well furnished with authorities, gendarmes, and commissaries of police. They therefore began operations as soon as the telegraphic dispatch arrived, and the Bell and Bottle being the best-known hotel in the town, they had naturally directed their first inquiries there. Now, besides the report of the sentinels guarding the Hotel de Ville, which is next door to the Bell and Bottle, it had been stated by others that a number of travelers had arrived during the night. The sentinel, who was relieved at six o'clock in the morning, remembered perfectly that just as he was taking his post a few minutes past four, a young man arrived on horseback, with a little boy before him. The young man, having dismissed the boy and horse, knocked at the door of the hotel, which was opened, and again closed after his entrance. This late arrival had attracted much suspicion, and the young man being no other than Andrea, the commissary and gendarme, who was a brigadier, directed their steps towards his room. They found the door ajar. Oh ho, said the brigadier, who thoroughly understood the trick. A bad sign to find the door open. I would rather find it triply bolted. And indeed the little note and pin upon the table confirmed, or rather corroborated, the sad truth. Andrea had fled. We say corroborated because the brigadier was too experienced to be convinced by a single proof. He glanced around, looked in the bed, shook the curtains, opened the closets, and finally stopped at the chimney. Andrea had taken the precaution to leave no traces of his feet in the ashes, but still it was an outlet, and in this light was not to be passed over without serious investigation. The brigadier sent for some sticks and straw, and having filled the chimney with them, set a light to it. The fire crackled, and the smoke ascended like the dull vapor from a volcano, but still no prisoner fell down as they expected. The fact was that Andrea, at war with society ever since his youth, was quite as deep as a gendarme, even though he were advanced to the rank of brigadier, and quite prepared for the fire, he had climbed out on the roof and was crouching down against the chimney-pots. At one time he thought he was saved, for he heard the brigadier exclaim in a loud voice to the two gendarmes, "'He is not here!' But venturing to peep, he perceived that the latter, instead of retiring as might have been reasonably expected upon this announcement, were watching with increased attention. It was now his turn to look about him, the Hotel de Ville, a massive sixteenth-century building, was on his right. Anyone could descend from the openings in the tower and examine every corner of the roof below, and Andrea expected momentarily to see the head of a gendarme appear at one of these openings. If once discovered, he knew he would be lost, for the roof afforded no chance of escape. He therefore resolved to descend, not through the same chimney by which he had come up, but by a similar one conducting to another room. He looked around for a chimney from which no smoke issued, and having reached it, he disappeared through the orifice without being seen by anyone. At the same minute, one of the little windows of the Hotel de Ville was thrown open, and the head of a gendarme appeared. For an instant it remained motionless as one of the stone decorations of the building, then after a long sigh of disappointment the head disappeared. The brigadier, calm and dignified as the law he represented, passed through the crowd, without answering the thousand questions addressed to him, and re-entered the hotel. Well, asked the two gendarmes. Well, my boys, said the brigadier, the brigand must really have escaped early this morning, but we will send to the Villers Coterets and Noyon roads and search the forest, when we shall catch him, no doubt. The honorable functionary had scarcely expressed himself thus, in that intonation which is particular to the brigadiers of the gendarmerie, when a loud scream, accompanied by the violent ringing of a bell, resounded through the court of the hotel. "'Ah! what is that?' cried the brigadier. "'Some traveller seems impatient,' said the host. "'What number was it that rang?' "'Number three. "'Run, waiter!' At this moment the screams and ringing were redoubled. "'Ah!' said the brigadier, stopping the servant. "'The person who is ringing appears to want something more than a waiter. "'We will attend upon him with a gendarme. "'Who occupies number three? the little fellow who arrived last night in a post-chaise with his sister, and who asked for an apartment with two beds. The bell here rang for the third time, with another shriek of anguish. 
"'Follow me, Mr. Commissary,' said the brigadier. "'Tread in my steps.' "'Wait an instant,' said the host. "'Number three has two staircases, inside and outside.' "'Good,' said the brigadier. "'I will take charge of the inside one. "'Are the carbines loaded?' "'Yes, brigadier.' "'Well, you guard the exterior, and if he attempts to fly, fire upon him. "'He must be a great criminal, from what the telegraph says.' The brigadier, followed by the commissary, disappeared by the inside staircase, accompanied by the noise which his assertions respecting Andrea had excited in the crowd. This is what had happened. Andrea had very cleverly managed to descend two-thirds of the chimney, but then his foot slipped, and notwithstanding his endeavors, he came into the room with more speed and noise than he intended. It would have signified little had the room been empty, but unfortunately it was occupied. Two ladies, sleeping in one bed, were awakened by the noise, and fixing their eyes upon the spot whence the sound proceeded, they saw a man. One of these ladies, the fair one, uttered those terrible shrieks which resounded through the house, while the other, rushing to the bell-rope, rang with all her strength. Andrea, as we can see, was surrounded by misfortune. "'For pity's sake!' he cried, pale and bewildered, without seeing whom he was addressing. "'For pity's sake, do not call assistance. Save me. I will not harm you.' "'Andrea, the murderer!' cried one of the ladies. "'Eugenie! Mademoiselle Danglars!' exclaimed Andrea, stupefied. "'Help! Help!' cried Mademoiselle d'Armilly, taking the bell from her companion's hand and ringing it yet more violently. "'Save me! I am pursued!' said Andrea, clasping his hands. "'For pity, for mercy's sake, do not deliver me up!' "'It is too late. They are coming,' said Eugenie. "'Well, conceal me somewhere. You can say you were needlessly alarmed. You can turn their suspicions and save my life.' The two ladies, pressing closely to one another, and drawing the bedclothes tightly around them, remained silent to this supplicating voice, repugnance and fear taking possession of their minds. "'Well, be it so,' at length said Eugenie. "'Return by the same road you came, and we will say nothing about you, unhappy wretch.' "'Here he is! Here he is!' cried a voice from the landing. "'Here he is! I see him!' The brigadier had put his eye to the keyhole, and had discovered Andrea in a posture of entreaty. A violent blow from the butt-end of the musket burst open the lock, two more forced out the bolts, and the broken door fell in. Andrea ran to the other door, leading to the gallery, ready to rush out, but he was stopped short, and he stood with his body a little thrown back, pale and with a useless knife in his clenched hand. "'Fly, then!' cried Mademoiselle d'Armilly, whose pity returned as her fears diminished. "'Fly!' "'Or kill yourself,' said Eugenie, in a tone which a vestal in the amphitheatre would have used, when urging the victorious gladiator to finish his vanquished adversary. Andrea shuddered and looked on the young girl with an expression which proved how little he understood such ferocious honor. "'Kill myself,' he cried, throwing down his knife. "'Why should I do so?' "'Why, you said,' answered Mademoiselle Danglars, "'that you would be condemned to die like the worst criminals.' "'Bah!' said Cavalcanti, crossing his arms. "'One has friends.' The brigadier advanced to him, sword in hand. "'Come, come,' said Andrea. "'Sheathe your sword, my fine fellow. "'There is no occasion to make such a fuss, since I give myself up.' And he held out his hands to be manacled. The girls looked with horror upon this shameful metamorphosis, the man of the world shaking off his covering and appearing as a galley-slave. Andrea turned towards them, and with an impertinent smile asked, "'Have you any message for your father, Mademoiselle Danglars? "'For in all probability I shall return to Paris.' Eugenie covered her face with her hands. "'Oh, ho!' said Andrea. "'You need not be ashamed, even though you did post after me. Was I not nearly your husband?' And with this raillery Andrea went out, leaving the two girls a prey to their own feelings of shame, and to the comments of the crowd. An hour after they stepped into their calash, both dressed in feminine attire. The gate of the hotel had been closed to screen them from sight but they were forced, when the door was opened, to pass through a throng of curious glances and whispering voices. Eugenie closed her eyes, but though she could not see, she could hear, and the sneers of the crowd reached her in the carriage. "'Oh, why is not the world a wilderness?' she exclaimed, throwing herself into the arms of Mademoiselle d'Armilly, her eyes sparkling with the same kind of rage which made Nero wish that the Roman world had but one neck, that he might sever it at a single blow." The next day they stopped at the Hotel de Flandre at Brussels. The same evening Andrea was incarcerated in the Conciergerie. End of chapter 98
For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kevin O'Coin. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 99 The Law. We have seen how quietly Mademoiselle Danglars and Mademoiselle Darmier accomplished their transformation in flight, the fact being that every one was too much occupied in his or her own affairs to think of theirs. We will leave the banker contemplating the enormous magnitude of his debt before the phantom of bankruptcy, and follow the baroness, who after being momentarily crushed under the weight of the blow which had struck her, had gone to seek her usual adviser, Lucien de Bray. The baroness had looked forward to this marriage as a means of ridding her of a guardianship which, over a girl of Eugenie's character, could not fail to be a rather troublesome undertaking, for in the tacit relations which maintain the bond of family union, the mother, to maintain her ascendancy over her daughter, must never fail to be a model of wisdom and a type of perfection. Now, Madame Danglars feared Eugenie's sagacity in the influence of Mademoiselle Darmier. She had frequently observed the contemptuous expression with which her daughter looked upon Debray, an expression which seemed to imply that she understood all her mother's amorous and pecuniary relationships with that intimate secretary. Moreover, she saw that Eugenie detested Debray, not only because he was a source of dissension and scandal under the paternal roof, but because she had at once classed him in that catalogue of bipeds whom Plato endeavours to withdraw from the appellation of men, and whom Diogenes designated as animals upon two legs without feathers. Unfortunately, in this world of ours, each person views things through a certain medium, and so is prevented from seeing in the same light as others, and Madame Danglars, therefore, very much regretted that the marriage of Eugenie had not taken place, not only because the match was good, and likely to ensure the happiness of her child, but because it would also set her at liberty. She ran therefore to Debray, who, after having, like the rest of Paris, witnessed the contract scene and the scandal attending it, had retired in haste to his club where he was chatting with some friends upon the events which served as a subject of conversation for three-fourths of that city known as the capital of the world. At the precise time when Madame Danglars, dressed in black and concealed in a long veil, was ascending the stairs leading to Debray's apartments, notwithstanding the assurances of the concierge that the young man was not at home, Debray was occupied in repelling the insinuations of a friend, who tried to persuade him that after the terrible scene which had taken place he ought, as a friend of the family, to marry Mademoiselle Danglars and her two millions. Debray did not defend himself very warmly, for the idea had sometimes crossed his mind. Still, when he recollected the independent, proud spirit of Eugenie, he positively rejected it as utterly impossible, though the same thought again continually recurred and found a resting place in his heart. T play, and the conversation which had become interesting during the discussion of such serious affairs lasted until one o'clock in the morning. Meanwhile, Madame Danglars, veiled and uneasy, awaited the return of Debray in the little green room, seated between two baskets of flowers, which she had that morning sent, and which, it must be confessed, Debray had arranged himself and watered, with so much care that his absence was half excused in the eyes of the poor woman. At twenty minutes of twelve, Madame Danglars, tired of waiting, returned home. Women of a certain grade are like prosperous grisettes in one respect. They seldom return home after twelve o'clock. The Baroness returned to the hotel with as much caution as Eugenie used in leaving it. She ran lightly upstairs, and with an aching heart entered her apartment, contiguous, as we know, to that of Eugenie. She was fearful of exciting any remark, and believed firmly in her daughter's innocence and fidelity to the paternal roof. She listened at Eugenie's door, and hearing no sound, tried to enter, but the bolts were in place. Madame Danglars then concluded that the young girl had been overcome with the terrible excitement of the evening, and had gone to bed and to sleep. She called the maid and questioned her. Mademoiselle Eugenie, said the maid, retired to her apartment with Mademoiselle Darmier. Then they took tea together, after which they desired me to leave, saying that they needed me no longer. Since then the maid had been below, and like everyone else she thought the young ladies were in their own room. Madame Danglars, therefore, went to bed without a shadow of suspicion, and began to muse over the recent events. In proportion as her memory became clearer, the occurrences of the evening were revealed in their true light. What she had taken for confusion was a tumult. What she had regarded as something distressing was in reality a disgrace. 
and then the baroness remembered that she had felt no pity for poor mercedes who had been afflicted with as severe a blow through her husband and son eugenie she said to herself is lost and so are we the affair as it will be reported will cover us with shame for in a society such as ours satire inflicts a painful and incurable wound how fortunate that eugenie is possessed of that strange character which has so often made me tremble and her glance was turned towards heaven where a mysterious providence disposes all things and out of a fault nay even a vice sometimes produces a blessing and then her thoughts cleaving through space like a bird in the air rested on cavalcanti this andrea was a wretch a robber an assassin and yet his manners showed the effects of a sort of education if not a complete one he had been presented to the world with the appearance of an immense fortune supported by an honorable name how could she extricate herself from this labyrinth to whom would she apply to help her out of this painful situation de bray to whom she had run with the first instinct of a woman towards the man she loves and who yet betrays her de bray could but give her advice she must apply to someone more powerful than he the baroness then thought of monsieur de villefort it was monsieur de villefort who had remorselessly brought misfortune into her family as though they had been strangers but no on reflection the procurer was not a merciless man and it was not the magistrate slave to his duties but the friend the loyal friend who roughly but firmly cut into the very core of the corruption it was not the executioner but the surgeon who wished to withdraw the honor of danglars from ignominious association with the disgraced young man they had presented to the world as their son-in-law and since villefort the friend of danglars had acted in this way no one could suppose that he had been previously acquainted with or had lent himself to any of andrea's intrigues villefort's conduct therefore upon reflection appeared to the baroness as if shaped for their mutual advantage but the inflexibility of the procurer should stop there she would see him the next day and if she could not make him fail in his duties as a magistrate she would at least obtain all the indulgence he could allow she would invoke the past recall old recollections she would supplicate him by the remembrance of guilty yet happy days monsieur de villefort would stifle the affair he had only to turn his eyes on one side and allow andrea to fly and follow up the crime under that shadow of guilt called contempt of court and after this reasoning she slept easily at nine o'clock next morning she arose and without ringing for her maid or giving the least sign of her activity she dressed herself in the same simple style as on the previous night then running downstairs she left the hotel walked to the rue de provence hailed a cab and drove to monsieur de villefort's house for the last month this wretched house had presented the gloomy appearance of a lazaretto infected with the plague some of the apartments were closed within and without the shutters were only open to admit a minute's air showing the scared face of a footman and immediately afterwards the windows would be closed like a gravestone falling on a sepulchre and the neighbors would say to each other in a low voice will there be another funeral today at the procurer's house madame danglars involuntarily shuddered at the desolate aspect of the mansion descending from the cab she appeared at the door with trembling knees and rang the bell three times did the bell ring with a dull heavy sound seeming to participate in the general sadness before the concierge appeared and peeped through the door which he opened just wide enough to allow his words to be heard he saw a lady a fashionable elegantly dressed lady and yet the door remained closed do you intend opening the door said the baroness first madam who are you who am i you know me well enough we no longer know anyone madam you must be mad my friend said the baroness where do you come from oh this is too much madame these are my orders excuse me your name the baroness danglars you have seen me twenty times possibly madam and now what do you want oh how extraordinary i shall complain to monsieur de villefort of the impertinence of his servants madame this is precaution not impertinence no one enters here without an order from monsieur d'avrigny or without speaking to the procurer 
Well, I have business with the procurer. Is it pressing business? You can imagine so, since I have not even brought my carriage out yet. But enough of this. Here is my card. Take it to your master. Madame will await my return? Yes, go. The concierge closed the door, leaving Madame Danglars in the street. She had not long to wait. Directly afterwards the door was opened wide enough to admit her, and when she had passed through, it was again shut. Without losing sight of her for an instant, the concierge took a whistle from his pocket as soon as they had entered the court and blew it. The valet de chambre appeared at the doorsteps. "'You will excuse this poor fellow, madame,' he said as he preceded the baroness, "'but his orders are precise, and Monsieur de Villefort begged me to tell you that he could not act otherwise.' In the court showing his merchandise was a tradesman who had been admitted with the same precautions. The baroness ascended the steps. She felt herself strongly infected with the sadness which seemed to magnify her own, and still guided by the valet de chambre, who never lost sight of her for an instant, was introduced to the magistrate's study. Preoccupied as Madame Danglars had been with the object of her visit, the treatment she had received from these underlings appeared to her so insulting that she began by complaining of it. But Villefort, raising his hand, bowed down by grief, looked up at her with so sad a smile that her complaints died upon her lips. Forgive my servants, he said, for a terror I cannot blame them for. From being suspected, they have become suspicious. Madame Danglars had often heard of the terror to which the magistrate alluded, but without the evidence of her own eyesight, she could not have ever believed that the sentiment had been carried so far. "'You too, then, are unhappy,' she said. "'Yes, madame,' replied the magistrate. "'Then you pity me?' "'Sincerely, madame.' "'And you understand what brings me here? "'You wish to speak to me about the circumstance which has just happened?' "'Yes, sir, a fearful misfortune.' "'You mean a mischance?' "'A mischance?' repeated the baroness. "'Alas, madame,' said the procurer with his imperturbable calmness of manner, "'I consider those alone misfortunes which are irreparable. "'And do you suppose this will be forgotten?' "'Everything will be forgotten, madame,' said Villefort. "'Your daughter will be married tomorrow, if not today, "'in a week, if not tomorrow, "'and I do not think you can regret the intended husband of your daughter.' Madame Danglars gazed on Villefort, stupefied to find him so almost insultingly calm. "'Am I come to a friend?' she asked in a tone full of mournful dignity. "'You know that you are, madame,' said Villefort, whose pale cheeks became slightly flushed as he gave her the assurance. And truly this assurance carried him back to different events from those now occupying the baroness and him. "'Well, then, be more affectionate, my dear Villefort,' said the baroness." Speak to me not as a magistrate, but as a friend, and when I am in bitter anguish of spirit, do not tell me that I ought to be gay. Villefort bowed. When I hear misfortunes named, madame, he said, I have within the last few months contracted the bad habit of thinking of my own, and then I cannot help drawing up an egotistical parallel in my mind. That is the reason that by the side of my misfortunes yours appear to be mere mischances. That is why my dreadful position makes yours enviable. But this annoys you. Let us change the subject. You were saying, madame. I came to ask you, my friend, said the baroness. What will be done with this impostor? Impostor, repeated Villefort. Certainly, madame, you appear to extenuate some cases and exaggerate others. Impostor, indeed. Monsieur Andrea Cavalcante or rather Monsieur Benedetto, is nothing more nor less than an assassin. Sir, I do not deny the justice of your correction, but the more severely you arm yourself against the unfortunate man, the more deeply you will strike our family. Come, forget him for a moment, and instead of pursuing him, let him go. You are too late, madame. The orders are issued. Well, should he be arrested? Do you think they will arrest him? I hope so. If they should arrest him, I know that sometimes prisoners afford means of escape, 
Will you leave him in prison? The procurer shook his head. At least keep him there till my daughter be married. Impossible, madame. Justice has its formalities. What? Even for me, said the baroness, half jesting, half in earnest. For all, even for myself among the rest, replied Villefort. Ah, exclaimed the baroness, without expressing the ideas which the exclamation betrayed. Villefort looked at her with that piercing glance which reads the secrets of the heart. Yes, I know what you mean, he said. You refer to the terrible rumors spread abroad in the world, that the deaths which have kept me in mourning for the last three months, and for which Valentine has only escaped by a miracle, have not happened by natural means. I was not thinking of that, replied Madame Danglars quickly. Yes, you were thinking of it, and with justice. You could not help thinking of it and saying to yourself, You, who pursue crime so vindictively, answer now. Why are there unpunished crimes in your dwelling? The baroness became pale. You were saying this, were you not? Well, I own it. I will answer you. Villefort drew his armchair nearer to Madame Danglars. Then, resting both hands upon his desk, he said in a voice more hollow than usual, There are crimes which remain unpunished because the criminals are unknown. And we may strike the innocent because of the guilty. But the culprits are discovered. Villefort here extended his hand toward a large crucifix placed opposite to his desk. When they are discovered, I swear to you, by all I hold most sacred, that whoever they may be shall die. Now, after the oath I have just taken, and which I will keep, madame, dare you ask for mercy for that wretch? But, sir, are you sure he is as guilty as they say? Listen, this is his description. Benedetto, condemned, at the age of sixteen, for five years to the galleys for forgery. He promised well, as you see, first a runaway, then an assassin. And who is this wretch? Who can tell? A vagabond? A Corsican? Has no one owned him? No one. His parents are unknown. But who was that man who brought him from Lucca? Another rascal like himself, perhaps his accomplice. The baroness clasped her hands. Villefort, she exclaimed in her softest and most captivating manner. For heaven's sake, madame, said Villefort with a firmness of expression not altogether free from harshness. For heaven's sake, do not ask me pardon for a guilty wretch. What am I? The law. Has the law any eyes to witness your grief? Has the law ears to be melded by your sweet voice? Has the law a memory for all those soft recollections you endeavor to recall? No, madame. The law has a command, and when it commands, it strikes. You will tell me that I am a living being and not a code, a man and not a volume. Look at me, madame. Look at me. Have mankind treated me as a brother? Have they loved me? Have they spared me? Has anyone shown that mercy towards me that you now ask at my hands? No, madame, they struck me, always struck me. Woman, siren that you are, do you persist in fixing on me that fascinating eye which reminds me that I ought to blush? Well, be it so. Let me blush for the faults you know, and perhaps, perhaps for even more than those, but having sinned myself, and maybe more deeply than others, I never rest till I have torn the disguises from my fellow creatures and found out their weaknesses. I have always found them, and more. I repeat it with joy, with triumph. I have always found some proof of human perversity or error. Every criminal I condemn seems to me living evidence that I am not a hideous exception to the rest. Alas! 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 All the world is wicked. Let us therefore strike at wickedness! Villefort pronounced these words with a feverish rage, which gave a ferocious eloquence to his words. But, Madame Danglars, resolving to make a last effort, this young man, though a murderer, is an orphan, abandoned by everybody. So much the worse, or rather, so much the better. It has been ordained that he may have none to weep his fate. 
But this is trampling on the weak, sir. The weakness of a murderer. His dishonor reflects upon us. Is death not in my house? Oh, sir, exclaimed the baroness, you are without pity for others. Well, then, I tell you, they will have no mercy on you. Be it so, said Villefort, raising his arms to heaven. At least, delay the trial till the next assizes. We shall have six months before us. No, madame, said Villefort. Instructions have been given. There are yet five days left. Five days are more than I require. Do you not think that I also long for forgetfulness? Well, working night and day, I sometimes lose all recollection of the past, and then I experience the same sort of happiness I can imagine the dead feel. Still, it is better than suffering. But, sir, he has fled. Let him escape. Inaction is a pardonable offense. I tell you it is too late. Early this morning the telegraph was employed, and at this very minute... Sir, said the valet de chambre, entering the room, a dragoon has brought this dispatch from the Minister of the Interior. Villefort seized the letter and hastily broke the seal. Madame Danglars trembled with fear. Villefort started with joy. Arrested, he exclaimed. He was taken at Compiègne, and all is over. Madame Danglars rose from her seat, pale and cold. Adieu, sir, she said. Adieu, madame, replied the king's attorney, as in an almost joyful manner he conducted her to the door. Then, turning to his desk, he said, striking the letter with the back of his hand, Come, I have had a forgery, three robberies, and two cases of arson. I only wanted a murder, and here it is. It will be a splendid session. End of chapter 99「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more The Apparition As the procurer had told Madame Danglas, Valentine was not yet recovered. Bowed down with fatigue, she was indeed confined to her bed, and it was in her own room and from the lips of Madame de Villefort that she heard all the strange events we have related. We mean the flight of Eugenie, and the arrest of Andrea Cavalcanti, or rather Benedetto, together with the accusation of murder pronounced against him. But Valentine was so weak that this recital scarcely produced the same effect it would have done had she been in her usual state of health. Indeed, her brain was only the seat of vague ideas, and confused forms, mingled with strange fancies, alone presented themselves before her eyes. During the daytime, Valentine's perceptions remained tolerably clear, owing to the constant presence of Monsieur Noirtier, who caused himself to be carried to his granddaughter's room, and watched her with his paternal tenderness. Villefort also, on his return from the law courts, frequently passed an hour or two with his father and child. At six o'clock, Villefort retired to his study. At eight, Monsieur Davrigny himself arrived bringing the night draft prepared for the young girl, and then Monsieur Noirtier was carried away. A nurse of the doctor's choice succeeded them, and never left till about ten or eleven o'clock, when Valentine was then asleep. As she went downstairs, she gave the keys of Valentine's room to Monsieur de Villefort, so that no one could reach the sick room, excepting through that of Madame de Villefort and little Edward. Every morning Morel called on Noirtier to receive news of Valentine, and extraordinary as it seemed, each day found him less uneasy. Certainly, though Valentine still laboured under dreadful nervous excitement, she was better, and moreover, Monte Cristo had told him when, half distracted, he had rushed to the Count's house, that if she were not dead in two hours she would be saved. Now, four days had elapsed, and Valentine still lived. The nervous excitement of which we speak pursued Valentine even in her sleep, or rather in that state of somnolence which succeeded her waking hours. It was then, in the silence of night, in the dim light shed from the alabaster lamp on the chimney-piece, that she saw the shadows pass and repass which hover over the bed of sickness, and fan the fever with their trembling wings. First she fancied she saw her stepmother threatening her. Then Morrel stretched his arms towards her, sometimes mere strangers, 
like the Count of Monte Cristo, came to visit her. Even the very furniture in these moments of delirium seemed to move, and this state lasted till about three o'clock in the morning, when a deep, heavy slumber overcame the young girl, from which she did not awake till daylight. On the evening of the day on which Valentine had learned of the flight of Eugenie and the arrest of Benedetto, Villefort having retired as well as Noirtier and Davrigny, her thoughts wandered in a confused maze, alternatively reviewing her own situation and the events she had just heard. Eleven o'clock had struck. The nurse, having placed the beverage prepared by the doctor within reach of the patient and locked the door, was listening with terror to the comments of the servants in the kitchen and storing her memory with all the horrible stories which had for some months past amused the occupants of the antechambers in the house of the king's attorney. Meanwhile, an unexpected scene was passing in the room which had been so carefully locked. Ten minutes had elapsed since the nurse had left. Valentine, who for the last hour had been suffering from the fever which returned nightly, incapable of controlling her ideas, was forced to yield to the excitement which exhausted itself in producing and reproducing a succession and recurrence of the same fancies and images. The night lamp threw out countless rays, each resolving itself into some new form to her disordered imagination, when suddenly by its flickering light, Valentine thought she saw the door of her library, which was in the recess by the chimney piece, open slowly, though she in vain listened for the sound of the hinges on which it turned. At any other time, Valentine would have seized the silken bell pull and summoned assistance, but nothing astonished her in her present situation. Her reason told her that all the visions she beheld were but the children of her imagination, and the conviction was strengthened by the fact that in the morning no traces remained of the nocturnal phantoms, who disappeared with the coming of daylight. From behind the door a human figure appeared, but the girl was too familiar with such apparitions to be alarmed, and therefore only stared, hoping to recognise Moral. The figure advanced towards the bed, and appeared to listen with profound attention, at this moment a ray of light glanced across the face of the midnight visitor. It is not he, she murmured, and waited, in the assurance that this was but a dream, for the man to disappear or assume some other form. Still, she felt her pulse, and finding it throb violently, she remembered that the best method of dispelling such illusions was to drink, for a draught of the beverage prepared by the doctor to allay her fever seemed to cause a reaction of the brain and for a short time she suffered less. Valentine, therefore, reached her hand towards the glass, but as soon as her trembling arm left the bed, the apparition advanced more quickly towards her, and approached the young girl so closely that she fancied she heard its breath, and felt the pressure of his hand. This time the illusion, or rather the reality, surpassed anything Valentine had before experienced. She began to believe herself really alive and awake, and the belief that her reason was this time not deceived made her shudder. The pressure she felt was evidently intended to arrest her arm, and she slowly withdrew it. Then the figure, from whom she could not detach her eyes, and who appeared more protecting than menacing, took the glass, and walking towards the nightlight held it up, as if to test its transparency. This did not seem sufficient. The man, or rather the ghost, for he trod so softly that no sound was heard, then poured out about a spoonful into the glass, and drank it. Valentine witnessed this scene with a sentiment of stupefaction. Every minute she had expected that it would vanish and give place to another vision. But the man, instead of dissolving like a shadow, again approached her, and said in an agitated voice, Now you may drink. Valentine shuddered. It was the first time one of these visions had ever addressed her in a living voice and she was about to utter an exclamation. The man placed his finger on her lips. The Count of Monte Cristo, she murmured. It was easy to see that no doubt now remained in the young girl's mind as to the reality of the scene. Her eyes started with terror, her hands trembled, and she rapidly drew the bedclothes closer to her. Still, the presence of Monte Cristo at such an hour, his mysterious, fanciful, an extraordinary entrance into her room through the wall, might well seem impossibilities to her shattered reason. Do not call anyone. Do not be alarmed, said the Count. Do not let a shade of suspicion or uneasiness remain in your breast. The man standing before you, Valentine, for this time it is no ghost, is nothing more than the tenderest father and the most respectful friend you could dream of. 
Valentine could not reply. The voice which indicated the real presence of a being in the room alarmed her so much that she feared to utter a syllable. Still the expression of her eyes seemed to inquire, If your intentions are pure, why are you here? The Count's marvellous sagacity understood all that was passing in the young girl's mind. Listen to me, he said, or rather, look upon me, look at my face, paler even than usual, and my eyes, red with weariness. For four days I have not closed them, for I have been constantly watching you, to protect and preserve you for Maximilian. The blood mounted rapidly to the cheeks of Valentine, for the name just announced by the Count dispelled all the fear with which his presence had inspired her. Maximilian! she exclaimed, and so sweet did the sound appear to her that she repeated it. Maximilian! Has he then owned all to you? Everything. He told me your life was his, and I have promised him that you shall live. You have promised him that I shall live? Yes. But, sir, you spoke of vigilance and protection. Are you a doctor? Yes. The best you could have at the present time, believe me. But you say you have watched? said Valentine uneasily. Where have you been? I have not seen you. The Count extended his hand towards the library. I was hidden behind that door, he said, which leads into the next house, which I have rented. Valentine turned her eyes away, and, with an indignant expression of pride and modest fear, exclaimed, Sir, I think you have been guilty of an unparalleled intrusion, and that what you call protection is more like an insult. Valentine, he answered, during my long watch over you, all I have observed has been what people visited you, what nourishment was prepared, and what beverage was served. Then, when the latter appeared dangerous to me, I entered, as I have now done, and substituted, in the place of the poison, a healthful draught, which, instead of producing the death intended, caused life to circulate in your veins. Poison? Death? exclaimed Valentine, half believing herself under the influence of some feverish hallucination. What are you saying, sir? Hush, my child, said Monte Cristo, again placing his finger upon her lips. I did say poison and death, but drink some of this. And the Count took a bottle from his pocket, containing a red liquid, of which he poured a few drops into the glass. Drink this, and then take nothing more tonight. Valentine stretched out her hand, but scarcely had she touched the glass when she drew back in fear. Monte Cristo took the glass, drank half of its contents, and then presented it to Valentine, who smiled and swallowed the rest. Oh yes, she exclaimed, I recognize the flavor of my nocturnal beverage, which refreshed me so much, and seemed to ease my aching brain. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is how you have lived during the last four nights, Valentine, said the Count. But, oh, how I passed that time. Oh, the wretched hours I have endured. The torture to which I have submitted when I saw the deadly poison poured into your glass. And how I trembled lest you should drink it before I could find time to throw it away. Sir, said Valentine, at the height of her terror, you say you endured tortures? when you saw the deadly poison poured into my glass. But if you saw this, you must also have seen the person who poured it. Yes. Valentine raised herself in bed and drew over her chest, which appeared whiter than snow, the embroidered cambric, still moist with the cold dews of delirium, to which were now added those of terror. You saw the person? repeated the young girl. Yes, repeated the Count. What you tell me is horrible, sir. You wish to make me believe something too dreadful. What? Attempt to murder me in my father's house? In my room? On my bed of sickness? Oh, leave me, sir. You are tempting me. You make me doubt the goodness of providence. It is impossible. It cannot be. 
Are you the first that this hand has stricken? Have you not seen Monsieur de Saint-Marin, Madame de Saint-Marin, Barrois, all fall? Would not Monsieur Noirtier also have fallen a victim, had not the treatment he has been pursuing for the last three years neutralised the effects of the poison? Oh, heaven, said Valentine. Is this the reason why Grandpapa has made me share all his beverages during the last month? And have they all tasted of a slightly bitter flavour, like that of dried orange peel? Oh, yes, yes. Then that explains all, said Monte Cristo. Your grandfather knows, then, that a poisoner lives here, perhaps even suspects the person. He has been fortifying you, his beloved child, against the fatal effects of the poison which has failed because your system was already impregnated with it. But even this would have availed little against the more deadly medium of death employed four days ago, which is generally but too fatal. But who, then, is this assassin, this murderer? Let me also ask you a question. Have you never seen anyone enter your room at night? Oh, yes. I have frequently seen shadows pass close to me, approach, and disappear. But I took them for visions, raised by my feverish imagination. And indeed, when you entered, I thought I was under the influence of delirium. Then you do not know who it is that attempts your life. No, said Valentine. Who could desire my death? You shall know it now, then, said Monte Cristo, listening. How do you mean? said Valentine, looking anxiously around. Because you are not feverish or delirious tonight. But thoroughly awake, midnight is striking, which is the hour the murderers choose. Oh, heavens! exclaimed Valentine, wiping off the drops which ran down her forehead. Midnight struck, slowly and sadly. Every hour seemed to strike with leaden weight upon the heart of the poor girl. Valentine, said the Count, summon up all your courage, still the beatings of your heart. Do not let a sound escape you, and feign to be asleep, then you will see. Valentine seized the Count's hand. I think I hear a noise, she said. Leave me. Goodbye, for the present, replied the Count, walking upon tiptoe towards the library door, and smiling with an expression so sad and paternal that the young girl's heart was filled with gratitude. Before closing the door, he turned around once more and said, Not a movement, not a word. Let them think you're asleep, or perhaps you may be killed before I have the power of helping you. And with this fearful injunction, the Count disappeared through the door, which noiselessly closed after him. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Carl, St. Louis, Missouri, October 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 101. La Custa. Valentine was alone. Two other clocks, slower than that of Saint Philippe du Roule, struck the hour of midnight from different directions, and excepting the rumbling of a few carriages, all was silent. Then Valentine's attention was engrossed by the clock in her room, which marked the seconds. She began counting them, remarking that they were much slower than the beatings of her heart, and still she doubted. The inoffensive Valentine could not imagine that any one should desire her death. Why should they? To what end? And what had she done to excite the malice of an enemy? There was no fear in her falling asleep. One terrible idea pressed upon her mind, that some one existed in the world who had attempted to assassinate her, and who was about to endeavor to do so again. Supposing this person, wearied at the inefficacy of the poison, should, as Monte Cristo intimated, have recourse to steel. What if the Count should have no time to run to her rescue? What if her last moments were approaching, and she should never again see Morel? When this terrible chain of ideas presented itself, Valentine was nearly persuaded to ring the bell and call for help. But through the door she fancied she saw the luminous eye of the Count, that eye which lived in her memory. 
and the recollection overwhelmed her with so much shame that she asked herself whether any amount of gratitude could ever repay his adventurous and devoted friendship. Twenty minutes, twenty tedious minutes, passed thus, then ten more, and at last the clock struck the half-hour. Just then the sound of fingernails slightly grating against the door of the library informed Valentine that the Count was still watching, and recommended her to do the same. At the same time, on the opposite side, that is, toward Edward's room, Valentine fancied that she heard the creaking of the floor. She listened attentively, holding her breath till she was nearly suffocated. The clock turned, and the door slowly opened. Valentine had raised herself upon her elbow, and had scarcely time to throw herself down on the bed and shade her eyes with her arm, then, trembling, agitated, and her heart beating with indescribable terror, she awaited the event. Some one approached the bed and drew back the curtains. Valentine summoned every effort and breathed with that regular respiration which announces tranquil sleep. Valentine, said a low voice. Still silent, Valentine had promised not to wake. Then everything was still, excepting that Valentine heard the almost noiseless sound of some liquid being poured into the glass she had just emptied. Then she ventured to open her eyelids and glance over her extended arm. She saw a woman in a white dressing gown pouring a liquid from a vial into her glass. During this short time, Valentine must have held her breath or moved in some slight degree, for the woman, disturbed, stopped and leaned over the bed in order the better to ascertain whether Valentine slept. It was Madame de Dillifort. On recognizing her stepmother, Valentine could not repress a shudder, which caused a vibration in the bed. Madame de Dillifort instantly stepped back close to the wall, and there, shaded by the bed curtains, she silently and attentively watched the slightest movement of Valentine. The latter recollected the terrible caution of the Monte Cristo. She fancied that the hand, not holding the vial, clasped a long, sharp knife. Then, collecting all her remaining strength, she forced herself to close her eyes. But this simple operation upon the most delicate organs of our fame, generally so easy to accomplish, became almost impossible at this moment. So much did curiosity struggle to retain the eyelid open and learn the truth. Madame de Dillifort, however, reassured by the silence, which was alone disturbed by the regular breathing of Valentine, again extended her hand, and half hidden by the curtains, succeeded in emptying the contents of the vial into the glass. Then she retired so gently that Valentine did not know she had left the room. She only witnessed the withdrawal of the arm, the fair round arm of a woman, but twenty-five years old, who had yet spread death around her. It is impossible to describe the sensations experienced by Valentine during the minute and a half Madame de Dillifort remained in the room. The grating against the library door aroused the young girl from the stupor in which she was plunged, and which almost amounted to insensibility. She raised her head with an effort. The noiseless door again turned on its hinges, and the Comte of Monte Cristo reappeared. Well, said he, do you still doubt? Oh, murmured the young girl. Have you seen? Alas! Did you recognize? Valentine groaned. Oh, yes, she said. I saw, but I cannot believe. You would rather die, then, and cause Maximilian's death. Oh, repeated the young girl, almost bewildered. Can I not leave the house? Can I not escape? Valentine, the hand which now threatens you will pursue you everywhere. Your servants will be seduced with gold, and death will be offered to you disguised in every shape. You will find it in the water you drink from the spring, in the fruit you pluck from the tree. But did you not say that my kind grandfather's precaution had neutralized the poison? Yes, but not against a strong dose. The poison will be changed and the quantity increased. He took the glass and raised it to his lips. It is already done, he said. Brucine is no longer employed, but a simple narcotic. I can recognize the flavor of the alcohol in which it has been dissolved. If you had taken what Madame de Dillifort has poured into your glass, Valentine, 
Valentine, you would have been doomed. But, exclaimed the young girl, why am I thus pursued? Why, you are so kind, so good, so unsuspicious of ill, that you cannot understand, Valentine? No, I have never injured her. But you are rich, Valentine. You have two hundred thousand livres a year, and you prevent her son from enjoying those two hundred thousand livres. How so? The fortune is not her gift, but is inherited from my relations. Certainly, and that is why Monsieur and Madame de saint Morin have died. That is why Monsieur Nottierier was sentenced the day he made you his heir. That is why you, in your turn, are to die. It is because your father would inherit your property and your brother, his only son, succeed to his. Edward? Poor child! Are all these crimes committed on his account? Ah, then you at length understand. Heaven grant that this may not be visited upon him. Valentine, you are an angel. But why is my grandfather allowed to live? It was considered that you dead, the fortune would naturally revert to your brother, unless he were disinherited, and, besides, the crime appearing useless, it would be folly to commit it. And is it possible that this frightful combination of crimes has been invented by a woman? Do you recollect in the arbor of the Hotel de Bost, at Perugia, seeing a man in a brown cloak, whom your stepmother was questioning upon Aquatofana? Well, ever since then, the infernal project has been ripening in her brain. Ah, then, indeed, sir, said the sweet girl, bathed in tears, I see that I am condemned to die. No, Valentine, for I have foreseen all their plots. No, your enemy is conquered since we know her, and you will live, Valentine, live to be happy yourself, and to confer happiness upon a noble heart. But to ensure this, you must rely on me. Command me, sir. What am I to do? You must blindly take what I give you. A last word only for my sake I should prefer to die. You must not confide in any one, not even in your father. My father is not engaged in this fearful plot, is he, sir? asked Valentine, clasping her hands. No, and yet your father, a man accustomed to judicial accusations, ought to have known that all these deaths have not happened naturally. It is he who should have watched over you. He should have occupied my place. He should have emptied that glass. He should have risen against the assassin, specter against specter, he murmured in a low voice as he concluded his sentence. Sir, said Valentine, I will do all I can to live, for there are two things whose existence depends on mine, my grandfather and Maximilian. I will watch over them as I have over you. Well, sir, do as you will with me. And then she added in a low voice, Oh, heavens, what will befall me? Whatever may happen, Valentine, do not be alarmed. Though you suffer, though you lose sight, hearing, consciousness, fear nothing. Though you should awake and be ignorant where you are, still do not fear. Even though you should find yourself in a sepulchral vault or coffin, reassure yourself then, and say to yourself, At this moment a friend, a father, who lives for my happiness and that of Maximilian watches over me. Alas, alas, what a fearful extremity! Valentine, would you rather denounce your stepmother? I would rather die a hundred times. Oh, yes, die! No, you will not die. But you will promise me whatever happens that you will not complain. But hope? I will think of Maximilian. You are my own darling child, Valentine. I alone can save you, and I will. Valentine, in the extremity of her terror, joined her hands, for she felt that the moment had arrived to ask for courage, and began to pray. And while uttering little more than incoherent words, she forgot that her white shoulders had no other covering than her long hair, and that the pulsations of her heart could be seen through the lace of her nightdress. Monte Cristo gently laid his hand on the young girl's arm, drew the velvet coverlet close to her throat, and said with a paternal smile, My child, 
believe in my devotion to you as you believe in the goodness of Providence and the love of Maximilian. Then he drew from his waistcoat pocket a little emerald box, raised the gold lid, and took from it a pastille about the size of a pea, which he placed in her hand. She took it and looked attentively on the count. There was an expression on the face of her intrepid protector which commanded her veneration. She evidently interrogated him by her look. Yes, said he. Valentine carried the pastille to her mouth and swallowed it. And now, my dear child, adieu for the present. I will try and gain a little sleep, for you are saved. Go, said Valentine. Whatever happens, I promise you not to fear. Monte Cristo for some time kept his eyes fixed on the young girl, who gradually fell asleep, yielding to the effects of the narcotic the Count had given her. Then he took the glass, emptied three parts of the contents in the fireplace, that it might be supposed Valentine had taken it, and replaced it on the table. Then he disappeared, after throwing a farewell glance on Valentine, who slept with the confidence and innocence of an angel. End of chapter 101 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Christy Nowak. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 102. Valentine. The night light continued to burn on the chimney piece, exhausting the last drops of oil which floated on the surface of the water. The globe of the lamp appeared of a reddish hue, and the flame, brightening before it expired, threw out the last flickerings which, in an inanimate object, have been so often compared with the convulsions of a human creature in its final agonies. A dull and dismal light was shed over the bedclothes and curtains surrounding the young girl. All noise in the streets had ceased, and the silence was frightful. It was then that the door of Edward's room opened, and a head we have before noticed appeared in the glass opposite. It was Madame de Villefort who came to witness the effects of the drink she had prepared. She stopped in the doorway, listened for a moment to the flickering of the lamp, the only sound in that deserted room, and then advanced to the table to see if Valentine's glass were empty. It was still about a quarter full, as we before stated. Madame de Villefort emptied the contents into the ashes, which she disturbed that they might more readily absorb the liquid. Then she carefully rinsed the glass, and, wiping it with her handkerchief, replaced it on the table. If anyone could have looked into the room just then, he would have noticed the hesitation with which Madame Villefort approached the bed and looked fixedly on Valentine. The dim light, the profound silence, and the gloomy thoughts inspired by the hour, and still more by her own conscience, all combined to produce a sensation of fear. The poisoner was terrified at the contemplation of her own work. At length she rallied, drew aside the curtain, and leaning over the pillow gazed intently on Valentine. The young girl no longer breathed. No breath issued through the half-closed teeth. The white lips no longer quivered. The eyes were suffused with a bluish vapor, and the long black lashes rested on a cheek white as wax. Madame de Villefort gazed upon the face so expressive even in its stillness, then she ventured to raise the coverlet and pressed her hand upon the young girl's heart. It was cold and motionless. She only felt the pulsation of her own fingers and withdrew her hand with a shudder. One arm was hanging out of the bed. From shoulder to elbow it was molded after the arms of Germain Pilon's graces. But the forearm seemed to be slightly distorted by convulsions, and the hand, so delicately formed, was resting with stiff, outstretched fingers on the framework of the bed. The nails, too were turning blue. Madame de Villefort had no longer any doubt. All was over. She had consummated the last terrible work she had to accomplish. There was no more to do in the room, so the poisoner retired stealthily, as though fearing to hear the sound of her own footsteps. But as she withdrew, she still held aside the curtain, absorbed in the irresistible attraction always exerted by the picture of death, so long as it is merely mysterious and does not excite disgust. Just then the lamp again flickered. The noise startled Madame de Villefort, who shuddered and dropped the curtain. Immediately afterwards the light expired, and the room was plunged in frightful obscurity, while the clock at the minute struck half-past four. 
Overpowered with agitation, the poisoner succeeded in groping her way to the door and reached her room in an agony of fear. The darkness lasted two hours longer. Then, by degrees, a cold light crept through the Venetian blinds until at length it revealed the objects in the room. About this time the nurse's cough was heard on the stairs, and the woman entered the room with a cup in her hand. To the tender eye of a father or a lover, the first glance would have sufficed to reveal Valentine's condition, but to this hireling Valentine only appeared to sleep. "'Good!' she exclaimed, approaching the table. "'She has taken part of her draught. The glass is three-quarters empty.' Then she went to the fireplace and lit the fire, and although she had just left her bed, she could not resist the temptation offered by Valentine's sleep, so she threw herself into an armchair to snatch a little more rest. The clock, striking eight, awoke her. Astonished at the prolonged slumber of the patient, and frightened to see that the arm was still hanging out of the bed, she advanced towards Valentine, and for the first time noticed the white lips. She tried to replace the arm, but it moved with a frightful rigidity which could not deceive a sick nurse. She screamed aloud, then, running to the door, exclaimed, "'Help! Help!' "'What is the matter?' asked Monsieur de Vernet, at the foot of the stairs, it being the hour he usually visited her. "'What is it?' asked Villefort, rushing from his room. "'Doctor, do you hear them call for help?' "'Yes, yes, let us hasten up. It was in Valentine's room.' But before the doctor and the father could reach the room, the servants, who were on the same floor, had entered, and seeing Valentine pale and motionless on her bed, they lifted up their hands towards heaven and stood transfixed as though struck by lightning. "'Wake Madame de Villefort!' cried the procureur from the door of his chamber, which apparently he scarcely dared to leave. But instead of obeying him, the servant stood watching Monsieur de Vernet, who ran to Valentine and raised her in his arms. "'What? This one, too?' he exclaimed. "'Oh, where will be the end?' Villefort rushed into the room. "'What are you saying, doctor?' he exclaimed, raising his hands to heaven. "'I say that Valentine is dead,' replied Deverny in a voice terrible in its solemn calm. Monsieur de Villefort staggered and buried his head in the bed. On the exclamation of the doctor and the cry of the father, the servants all fled with muttered imprecations. They were heard running down the stairs and through the long passages. Then there was a rush in the court. Afterwards all was still.' They had, one and all, deserted the accursed house. Just then, Madame de Villefort, in the act of slipping on her dressing-gown, threw aside the drapery and, for a moment, stood motionless, as though interrogating the occupants of the room, while she endeavoured to call up some rebellious tears. On a sudden she stepped, or rather bounded, with outstretched arms toward the table. She saw de Vernier curiously examining the glass, which she felt certain of having emptied during the night. It was now a third full— just as it was when she threw the contents into the ashes. The spectre of Valentine rising before the poisoner would have alarmed her less. It was, indeed, the same color as the draught she had poured into the glass and which Valentine had drank. It was, indeed, the poison, which could not deceive Monsieur Javigny, which he now examined so closely. It was doubtless a miracle from heaven that, notwithstanding her precautions, there should be some trace, some proof remaining to reveal the crime while Madame de Villefort remained rooted to the spot like a statue of terror, and Villefort, with his head hidden in the bedclothes, saw nothing around him. D'Avrigny approached the window, that he might the better examine the contents of the glass, and, dipping the tip of his finger in, tasted it. "'Ah!' he exclaimed. "'It is no longer brucine that is used. Let me see what it is.' Then he ran to one of the cupboards in Valentine's room, which had been transformed into a medicine closet, and taking from its silver case a small bottle of nitric acid, dropped a little of it into the liquor, which immediately changed to a blood-red color. Ah! exclaimed D'Avrigny, in a voice in which the horror of a judge unveiling the truth was mingled with the delight of a student making a discovery. Madame de Villefort was overpowered. Her eyes first flashed and then swam. She staggered towards the door and disappeared. Directly afterwards the distant sound of a heavy weight falling on the ground was heard, but no one paid any attention to it. The nurse was engaged in watching the chemical analysis, and Villefort was still absorbed in grief. Monsieur d'Avigny alone had followed Madame de Villefort with his eyes, and watched her hurried retreat. He lifted up the drapery over the entrance to Edward's room, and his eye reaching as far as Madame de Villefort's apartment, he beheld her extended, lifeless, on the floor. "'Go to the assistance of Madame de Villefort,' he said to the nurse. "'Madame de Villefort is ill.' "'But Mademoiselle de Villefort,' stammered the nurse. "'Mademoiselle de Villefort no longer requires help,' said D'Avrigny, "'since she is dead.' "'Dead! Dead!' 
groaned forth Villefort in a paroxysm of grief, which was the more terrible from the novelty of the sensation in the iron heart of that man. "'Dead!' repeated a third voice. "'Who said Valentine was dead?' The two men turned round and saw Morel standing at the door, pale and terror-stricken. This is what had happened. At the usual time, Morel had presented himself at the little door leading to Nortier's room. Contrary to custom, the door was open, and having no occasion to ring, he entered. He waited for a moment in the hall and called for a servant to conduct him to Monsieur Noirtier, but no one answered, the servants having, as we know, deserted the house. Morel had no particular reason for uneasiness. Monte Cristo had promised him that Valentine should live, and so far he had always fulfilled his word. Every night the Count had given him news, which was the next morning confirmed by Noirtier. Still, this extraordinary silence appeared strange to him, and he called a second and third time. Still no answer. Then he determined to go up. Noirtier's room was opened, like all the rest. The first thing he saw was the old man sitting in his armchair in his usual place, but his eyes expressed alarm, which was confirmed by the pallor which overspread his features. "'How are you, sir?' asked Morel, with a sickness of heart. "'Well,' answered the old man, by closing his eyes, but his appearance manifested increasing uneasiness. "'You are thoughtful, sir,' continued Morel. "'You want something. Shall I call one of the servants?' "'Yes,' replied Noitier. Morel pulled the bell, but though he nearly broke the cord, no one answered. He turned towards Noitier. The pallor and anguish expressed on his countenance momentarily increased." Oh! exclaimed Morel, why do they not come? Is anyone ill in the house? The eyes of Noirtier seemed as though they would start from their sockets. What is the matter? You alarm me. Valentine? Valentine? Yes, yes, signed Noirtier. Maximilian tried to speak, but he could articulate nothing. He staggered and supported himself against the wainscot. Then he pointed to the door. Yes, 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 continued the old man. Maximilian rushed up the little staircase, while Noirtier's eyes seemed to say, "'Quicker! Quicker!' In a minute the young man darted through several rooms, till at length he reached Valentine's. There was no occasion to push the door. It was wide open. A sob was the only sound he heard. He saw, as though in a mist, a black figure kneeling and buried in a confused mass of white drapery. A terrible fear transfixed him. It was then he heard a voice exclaim, "'Valentine is dead!' and another voice, which, like an echo, repeat, Dead! Dead! End of chapter 102《Maximilian》Villefort rose, half ashamed of being surprised in such a paroxysm of grief. The terrible office he had held for twenty-five years had succeeded in making him more or less than man. His glance, at first wandering, fixed itself upon Morel. "'Who are you, sir?' he asked. "'That forget that this is not the manner to enter a house stricken with death? Go, sir, go!' But Morel remained motionless. He could not detach his eyes from that disordered bed and the pale corpse of the young girl who was lying on it. "'Go! Do you hear?' said Villefort, while Davigny advanced to lead Morel out. Maximilian stared for a moment at the corpse, gazed all around the room, then upon the two men. He opened his mouth to speak, but finding it impossible to give utterance to the innumerable ideas that occupied his brain, he went out thrusting his hand through his hair in such a manner that Villefort and Devigny, for a moment diverted from the engrossing topic, exchanged glances which seemed to say, He is mad. But in less than five minutes the staircase groaned beneath an extraordinary weight. Morel was seen carrying, with superhuman strength, the armchair containing Noirtier upstairs. When he reached the landing he placed the armchair on the floor and rapidly rolled it into Valentine's room. This could only have been accomplished by means of unnatural strength supplied by powerful excitement. But the most fearful spectacle was Noirtier being pushed towards the bed, his face expressing all his meaning, and his eyes supplying the want of every other faculty. The pale face, the flaming glance, appeared to Villefort like a frightful apparition. Each time he had been brought into contact with his father, something terrible had happened. "'See what they have done!' 
cried Morel, with one hand leaning on the back of the chair, and the other extending towards Valentine. "'See, my father, see!' Villefort drew back, and looked with astonishment on the young man, who, almost a stranger to him, called Noitier his father. At this moment the whole soul of the old man seemed centred in his eyes, which became bloodshot. The veins of the throat swelled, his cheeks and temples became purple, as though he was struck with epilepsy. Nothing was wanting to complete this but the utterance of a cry. And the cry issued from his pores, if we may thus speak, a cry frightful in its silence. D'Avrigny rushed towards the old man, and made him inhale a powerful restorative. "'Sir,' cried Morel, seizing the moist hand of the paralytic, "'they ask me who I am, and what right I have to be here. Oh, you know it. Tell them. Tell them.' And the young man's voice was choked by sobs. As for the old man, his chest heaved with his panting respiration. One could have thought that he was undergoing the agonies preceding death. At length, happier than the young man who sobbed without weeping, tears glistened in the eyes of Noitier. "'Tell them,' said Morel in a hoarse voice, "'tell them that I am her betrothed. Tell them she was my beloved, my noble girl, my only blessing in the world. Tell them! Oh, tell them that corpse belongs to me!' The young man, overwhelmed by the weight of his anguish, fell heavily on his knees before the bed, which his fingers grasped with convulsive energy. D'Avigny, unable to bear the sight of this touching emotion, turned away, and Villefort, without seeking any further explanation, and attracted towards him by the irresistible magnetism which draws us towards those who have loved the people for whom we mourn, extended his hand towards the young man. But Morel saw nothing. He had grasped the hand of Valentine, and, unable to weep, vented his agony in groans as he bit the sheets. For some time nothing was heard in that chamber but sobs, exclamations, and prayers. At length Villefort, the most composed of all, spoke. "'Sir,' he said to Maximilian, "'you say you loved Valentine, that you were betrothed to her? I knew nothing of this arrangement, of this love, yet I, her father, forgive you, for I see that your grief is real and deep. And besides, my own sorrow is too great for anger to find a place in my heart. But you see that the angel whom you hoped for has left this earth. She has nothing more to do with the adoration of men. Take a last farewell, sir, of her sad remains.' Take the hand you expected to possess once more within your own, and then separate yourself from her forever. Valentine now requires only the ministrations of the priest. "'You are mistaken, sir,' exclaimed Morel, raising himself on one knee, his heart pierced by a more acute pang than any he had yet felt. "'You are mistaken. Valentine, dying as she has, not only requires our priest, but an avenger. You, Monsieur de la Forte, send for the priest. I will be the avenger.' "'What do you mean, sir?' "'What do you mean, sir?' asked Villefort, trembling at the new idea inspired by the delirium of Morel. "'I tell you, sir, that two persons exist in you. The father has mourned sufficiently. Now let the procureur fulfill his office.' The eyes of Noitier glistened, and D'Avrigny approached. "'Gentlemen,' said Morel, reading all that passed through the minds of the witnesses to the scene, "'I know what I am saying, and you know as well as I do what I am about to say. Valentine has been assassinated.' Villefort hung his head. D'Avrigny approached nearer, and Noitier said yes with his eyes. "'Now, sir,' continued Morel, "'in these days no one can disappear by violent means without some inquiries being made as to the cause of her disappearance, even were she not a young, beautiful, and adorable creature like Valentine. "'Mr. Procureur,' said Morel, with increasing vehemence, "'no mercy is allowed. I denounce the crime. It is your place to seek the assassin.' The young man's implacable eyes interrogated Villefort, who, on his side, glanced from Noitier to D'Avigny, but instead of finding sympathy in the eyes of the doctor and his father, he only saw an expression as inflexible as that of Maximilian. "'Yes,' indicated the old man. "'Assuredly,' said D'Avigny. "'Sir,' said Villefort, striving to struggle against this triple force and his own emotion, "'Sir, you are deceived. No one commits crimes here. I am stricken by fate.' It is horrible indeed, but no one assassinates. The eyes of Nautier lightened up with rage, and D'Avigny prepared to speak. Morel, however, extended his arm and commanded silence. And I say that murders are committed here, said Morel, whose voice, though lower in tone, lost none of its terrible distinctness. I tell you that this is the fourth victim within the last four months. I tell you Valentine's life was attempted by poison four days ago, though she escaped, owing to the precautions of Monsieur Noitier. I tell you that the dose has been double, the poison changed, and that this time it has succeeded. I tell you that you know these things as well as I do, since this gentleman has forewarned you, both as a doctor and as a friend. Oh, you rave, sir! 
exclaimed Villefort, in vain endeavouring to escape the net in which he was taken. "'I rave?' said Morel. "'Well, then I appeal to Monsieur Devigny himself. Ask him, sir, if he recollects the words he uttered in the garden of this house on the night of Madame de saint Morin's death. You thought yourself alone, and talked about the tragical death, and the fatality you mentioned then is the same which has caused the murder of Valentine.' Villefort and Devigny exchanged looks. "'Yes, yes,' continued Morel. "'Recall the scene.' for the words you thought were only given to silence and solitude fell into my ears. Certainly, after witnessing the culpable indolence manifested by Monsieur de la Fort towards his own relations, I ought to have denounced him to the authorities. Then I should not have been an accomplice to thy death, as I now am, sweet, beloved Valentine. But the accomplice shall become the avenger. This fourth murder is apparent to all, and if thy father abandon thee, Valentine, it is I, and I swear it, that shall pursue the assassin. And this time— as though nature had at least taken compassion on the vigorous frame, nearly bursting with its own strength. The words of Morel were stifled in his throat, his breast heaved, the tears, so long rebellious, gushed from his eyes, and he threw himself, weeping on his knees by the side of the bed. Then Davrigny spoke. "'And I, too,' he exclaimed in a low voice, "'I unite with Monsieur Morel in demanding justice for crime. My blood boils at the idea of having encouraged a murderer in my cowardly concession.' "'Oh, merciful heavens!' murmured Villefort. Morel raised his head, and reading the eyes of the old man, which gleamed with unnatural luster, Stay, he said. Monsieur Noitier wishes to speak. Yes, indicated Noitier, with an expression the more terrible from all his faculties being centred in his glance. Do you know the assassin? asked Morel. Yes, replied Noitier. And will you direct us? exclaimed the young man. Listen, Monsieur Javigny, listen. Noitier looked upon Morel with one of those melancholy smiles which had so often made Valentine happy, and thus fixed his attention. Then, having riveted the eyes of his interlocutor on his own, he glanced towards the door. "'Do you wish me to leave?' said Morel sadly. "'Yes,' replied Noitier. "'Alas, alas, sir, have pity on me!' The old man's eyes remained fixed on the door. "'May I at least return?' asked Morel. "'Yes.' "'Must I leave alone?' "'No.' Who am I to take with me? The procurer? No. The doctor? Yes. You wish to remain alone with Monsieur de Villefort? Yes. But can he understand you? Yes. Oh, said Villefort, inexpressibly delighted to think that the inquiries were to be made by him alone. Oh, be satisfied, I can understand my father. D'Avrigny took the young man's arm and led him out of the room. A more than death-like silence then reigned in the house. At the end of a quarter of an hour— a faltering footstep was heard, and Villefort appeared at the door of the apartment where Davigny and Morel had been staying, one absorbed in meditation, the other in grief. "'You can come,' he said, and led them back to Noitier. Morel looked attentively on Villefort. His face was livid, large drops rolled down his face, and in his fingers he held the fragments of a quill pen which he had torn to atoms. Gentlemen, he said in a hoarse voice, "'give me your word of honour that this horrible secret shall forever remain buried amongst ourselves.' the two men drew back. "'I entreat you,' continued Villefort. "'But,' said Morel, "'the culprit, the murderer, the assassin—' "'Do not alarm yourself, sir. Justice will be done,' said Villefort. "'My father has revealed the culprit's name. My father thirsts for revenge as much as you do, yet even he conjures you as I do to keep this secret. Do you not, father?' "'Yes,' resolutely replied Noirtier. Morel suffered an exclamation of horror and surprise to escape him. "'Oh, sir,' said Villefort, arresting Maximilian by the arm. If my father, the inflexible man, makes this request, it is because he knows, be assured, that Valentine will be terribly revenged. Is it not so, father? The old man made a sign in the affirmative. Villefort continued. He knows me, and I have pledged my word to him. Rest assured, gentlemen, that within three days, in a less time than justice would demand, the revenge I shall have taken for the murder of my child will be such as to make the boldest heart tremble." and as he spoke these words he ground his teeth and grasped the old man's senseless hand. "'Will this promise be fulfilled, Monsieur Noitier?' asked Morel, while Devigny looked inquiringly. "'Yes,' replied Noitier, with an expression of sinister joy. "'Swear, then,' said Villefort, joining the hands of Morel and D'Avrigny, "'swear that you will spare the honour of my house and leave me to avenge my child.' D'Avrigny turned round and uttered a very feeble yes, but Morel— disengaging his hand, rushed to the bed, and after having pressed the cold lips of Valentine with his own, hurriedly left, uttering a long, deep groan of despair and anguish. We have before stated that all the servants had fled. Monsieur de Villefort was therefore obliged to request Monsieur d'Avigny to superintend all the arrangements consequent upon a death in a large city, more especially a death under such suspicious circumstances. 
It was something terrible to witness the silent agony, the mute despair of Noirtier, whose tears silently rolled down his cheeks. Villefort retired to his study, and d'Avrigny left to summon the doctor of the mayoralty, whose office it is to examine bodies after decease, and who is expressly named the doctor of the dead. M. Noirtier could not be persuaded to quit his grandchild. At the end of a quarter of an hour, M. d'Avrigny returned with his associate. They found the outer gate closed, and not a servant remaining in the house. Villefort himself was obliged to open to them. But he stopped on the landing. He had not the courage to again visit the death-chamber. The two doctors, therefore, entered the room alone. Noirtier was near the bed, pale, motionless, and silent as the corpse. The district doctor approached with the indifference of a man accustomed to spend half his time amongst the dead. He then lifted the sheet, which was placed over the face, and just unclosed the lips. "'Alas,' said Devigny, "'she is indeed dead, poor child.' Yes, answered the doctor laconically, dropping the sheet he had raised. Noirtier uttered a kind of hoarse, rattling sound. The old man's eyes sparkled, and the good doctor understood that he wished to behold his child. He therefore approached the bed, and while his companion was dipping the fingers with which he had touched the lips of the corpse in chloride of lime, he uncovered the calm, pale face, which looked like that of a sleeping angel. A tear, which appeared in the old man's eyes, expressed his thanks to the doctor. The doctor of the dead then laid his permit on the corner of the table, and having fulfilled his duty, was conducted out by d'Avrigny. Villefort met them at the door of his study, having, in a few words, thanked the district doctor. He turned to d'Avrigny and said, "'And now the priest.' "'Is there any particular priest you wish to pray with, Valentine?' asked d'Avrigny. "'No,' said Villefort. "'Fetch the nearest.' "'The nearest,' said the district doctor, "'is a good Italian abbe who lives next door to you. Shall I call on him as I pass?' "'D'Avrigny,' said Villefort. Be so kind, I beseech you, as to accompany this gentleman. Here is the key of the door, so that you can go in and out as you please. You will bring the priest with you, and will oblige me by introducing him into my child's room. Do you wish to see him? I only wish to be alone. You will excuse me, will you not? A priest can understand a father's grief. And Monsieur de Villefort, giving the key to Javigny, again bade farewell to the strange doctor, and retired to his study, where he began to work. For some temperaments, work is a remedy for all afflictions. As the doctors entered the street, they saw a man in a cassock standing on the threshold of the next door. "'This is the abbe of whom I spoke,' said the doctor to d'Avigny. D'Avigny accosted the priest. "'Sir,' he said, "'are you disposed to confer a great obligation on an unhappy father who has just lost his daughter? I mean Monsieur de Villefort, the king's attorney.' "'Ah,' said the priest, in a marked Italian accent. "'Yes, I have heard that death is in that house. Then I need not tell you what kind of service he requires of you.' "'I was about to offer myself, sir,' said the priest. "'It is our mission to forestall our duties. "'It is a young girl. "'I know it, sir. "'The servants who fled from the house informed me. "'I also know that her name is Valentine, "'and I have already prayed for her.' "'Thank you, sir,' said d'Avrigny. "'Since you have commenced your sacred office, "'deign to continue it. "'Come and watch by the dead, "'and all the wretched family will be grateful to you. "'I am going, sir, "'and I do not hesitate to say "'that no prayers will be more fervent than mine.' D'Avrigny took the priest's hand, and without meeting Villefort, who was engaged in his study, they reached Valentine's room, which, on the following night, was to be occupied by the undertakers. On entering the room, Noirtier's eyes met those of the abbe, and no doubt he read some particular expression in them, for he remained in the room. D'Avrigny recommended the attention of the priest to the living as well as to the dead, and the abbe promised to devote his prayers to Valentine and his attentions to Noirtier. In order, doubtless, that he might not be disturbed while fulfilling his sacred mission, the priest rose as soon as d'Avrigny departed, and not only bolted the door through which the doctor had just left, but also that leading to Madame de Villefort's room. End of chapter 103This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Claire Gauget. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 104 Danglars' Signature. The next morning dawned dull and cloudy. During the night the undertakers had executed their melancholy office, and wrapped the corpse in the winding sheet, which, whatever may be said about the equality of death, is at least a last proof of the luxury so pleasing in life. This winding sheet was nothing more than a beautiful piece of cambric, which the young girl had bought a fortnight before. 
during the evening two men, engaged for the purpose, had carried Noirtier from Valentine's room into his own, and contrary to all expectation there was no difficulty in withdrawing him from his child. No one can say that Monsieur Noirtier did not love this child, and yet he sleeps. "'Yes, you are right,' replied Villefort, surprised. "'He sleeps indeed. And this is the more strange, since the least contradiction keeps him awake all night.' "'Grief has stunned him,' replied d'Avrigny, and they both returned thoughtfully to the procureur's study. "'See, I have not slept,' said Villefort, showing his undisturbed bed. "'Grief does not stun me. I have not been in bed for two nights. But then look at my desk. See what I have written during these two days and nights. I have filled those papers, and have made out the accusation against the assassin, Benedetto. Oh, work, work, my passion, my joy, my delight! It is for thee to alleviate my sorrows!' and he convulsively grasped the hand of d'Avrigny. "'Do you require my services now?' asked d'Avrigny. "'No,' said Villefort. "'Only return again at eleven o'clock. At twelve the—the—oh, the, oh, heavens, my poor, poor child!' And the procureur again, becoming a man, lifted up his eyes and groaned. "'Shall you be present in the reception-room?' "'No. I have a cousin who has undertaken this sad office. I shall work, doctor, when I forget everything." And indeed no sooner had the doctor left the room that he was again absorbed in study. On the doorsteps d'Avrigny met the cousin whom Villefort had mentioned, a personage as insignificant in our story as in the world he occupied, one of those beings designed from their birth to make themselves useful to others. He was punctual, dressed in black, with crape round his hat, and presented himself at his cousin's with a face made up for the occasion, and which he could alter as might be required. At twelve o'clock the morning coaches rolled into the paved court, and the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Honoré was filled with a crowd of idlers, equally pleased to witness the festivities or the mourning of the rich, and who rush with the same avidity to a funeral procession as to the marriage of a duchess. Gradually the reception-room filled, and some of our old friends made their appearance. We mean Debray, Chateaurenon, and Beauchamp, accompanied by all the leading men of the day at the bar, in literature or the army, for Monsieur de Villefort moved in the first Parisian circles, less owing to his social position than to his personal merit. The cousin, standing at the door, ushered in the guests, and it was rather a relief to the indifferent to see a person as unmoved as themselves, and who did not exact a mournful face or force tears, as would have been the case with a father, a brother, or a lover. Those who were acquainted soon formed into little groups. One of them was made of Debray, Chateaurenaud, and Beauchamp. "'Poor girl,' said Debray, like the rest— paying an involuntary tribute to the sad event. Poor girl! So young, so rich, so beautiful! Could you have imagined this scene, Chateaurenaud, when we saw her at the most three weeks ago, about to sign that contract? Indeed, no, said Chateaurenaud. Did you know her? I spoke to her once or twice at Madame de Morcerf's. Among the rest, she appeared to me charming, though rather melancholy. Where is her stepmother? Do you know? She is spending the day with the wife of the worthy gentleman who is receiving us. Who is he? Whom do you mean? The gentleman who receives us? Is he a deputy? Oh, no, I am condemned to witness those gentlemen every day, said Beauchamp, but he is perfectly unknown to me. Have you mentioned this death in your paper? It has been mentioned, but the article is not mine. Indeed, I doubt if it will please M. Villefort, for it says that if four successive deaths had happened anywhere else than in the house of the king's attorney, he would have interested himself somewhat more about it. Still, said Chateau Renaud, Dr. d'Avrigny, who attends my mother, declares he is in despair about it. But whom are you seeking, Debray? I am seeking the Count of Monte Cristo, said the young man. I met him on the boulevard on my way here, said Beauchamp. I think he is about to leave Paris. He was going to his banker. His banker? Danglars is his banker, is he not? asked Chateaurenaud of Debray. 
"'I believe so,' replied the secretary, with slight uneasiness. "'But Monte Cristo is not the only one I miss here. I do not see Morel.' "'Morel? Do they know him?' asked Chateau Renaud. "'I think he has only been introduced to Madame Villefort.' "'Still, he ought to have been here,' said Debray. "'I wonder what will be talked about to-night. This funeral is the news of the day. But hush! Here comes our Minister of Justice. He will feel obliged to make some little speech to the cousin.' And the three young men drew near to listen. Beauchamp told the truth when he said that on his way to the funeral he had met Monte Cristo, who was directing his steps towards the Rue de la Chose d'Antin to M. Danglars. The banker saw the carriage of the Count enter the courtyard, and advanced to meet him with a sad, though affable, smile. "'Well,' said he, extending his hand to Monte Cristo, "'I suppose you have come to sympathize with me, for indeed misfortune has taken possession of my house. When I perceived you, I was just asking myself whether I had not wished harm towards those poor Morcerfs, which would have justified the proverb of— he who wishes misfortunes to happen to others experiences them himself. Well, on my word of honour, I answered no. I wished no ill to Morcerf. He was a little proud, perhaps, for a man who, like myself, has risen from nothing. But we all have our faults. Do you know, Count, that persons of our time of life, not that you belong to the class, you are still a young man, but as I was saying— Persons of our time of life have been very unfortunate this year. For example, look at the puritanical procureur, who has just lost his daughter, and in fact nearly all his family in so singular a manner. Marcel dishonoured and dead, and then myself covered with ridicule through the villainy of Benedetto besides. Besides what? asked the Count. Alas, do you not know? What new calamity? My daughter, Mademoiselle Danglars, Eugénie has left us. Good heavens, what are you telling me? The truth, my dear Count. Oh, how happy you must be in not having either wife or children. Do you think so? Indeed I do. And so, Mademoiselle Danglars, she could not endure that insult offered to us by that wretch, so she asked permission to travel. And is she gone? The other night she left. With Madame Danglars? No, with a relation. But still we have quite lost our dear Eugénie, for I doubt whether her pride will ever allow her to return to France. Still, Baron, said Monte Cristo, family griefs, or indeed any other affliction which would crush a man whose child was his only treasure, are endurable to a millionaire. Philosophers may well say, and practical men will always support the opinion, that money mitigates many trials, and if you admit the efficacy of this sovereign balm, you ought to be very easily consoled, you, the king of finance, the focus of immeasurable power. Danglars looked at him askance, as though to ascertain whether he spoke seriously. Yes, he answered. If a fortune brings consolation, I ought to be consoled. I am rich. So far, dear sir, that your misfortune resembles the pyramids. If you wished to demolish them, you could not, and if it were possible, you would not dare. Danglars smiled at the good-natured pleasantry of the Count. That reminds me, he said, that when you entered I was on the point of signing five little bonds. I have already signed two. Will you allow me to do the same to the others? Pray do so. There was a moment's silence during which the noise of the banker's pen was alone heard, while Monte Cristo examined the gilt moulding on the ceiling. Are they Spanish, Haitian, or Neapolitan bonds? said Monte Cristo. No, said Danglars, smiling. They are bonds of the Bank of France, payable to bearer. Stay, Count, he added. You, who may be called the Emperor, if I claim the title of King of Finance, have you many pieces of paper of this size, each worth a million? The Count took in his hands the papers which Danglars had so proudly presented to him, and read, To the Governor of the Bank, Please pay to my order, from the fund deposited by me, the sum of a million, and charge the same to my account. Baron Danglars one, two, three, four, five, said Monte Cristo. 
five million. Why, what a crossness you are! This is how I transact business, said Danglars. It is really wonderful, said the Count. Above all, if, as I suppose, it is payable at sight. It is indeed, said Danglars. It is a fine thing to have such credit. Really, it is only in France these things are done. Five million on five little scraps of paper. It must be seen to be believed. You do not doubt it? No. You say so with an accent. Stay, you shall be convinced. Take my clerk to the bank, and you will see him leave it with an order on the treasury for the same sum. No, said Monte Cristo, folding the five notes. Most decidedly not. The thing is so curious. I will make the experiment myself. I am credited on you for six million. I have drawn nine hundred thousand francs. You therefore still owe me five million and a hundred thousand francs. I will take the five scraps of paper that I now hold as bonds, with your signature alone, and here is a receipt in full for the six million between us. I had prepared it beforehand, for I am much in want of money to day. And Monte Cristo placed the bonds in his pocket. With one hand, while with the other he held out the receipt to Danglars. If a thunderbolt had fallen at the banker's feet, he could not have experienced greater horror. What? he stammered. Do you mean to keep that money? Excuse me, excuse me, but I owe this money to the charity fund, a deposit which I promised to pay this morning. Oh, well then, said Monte Cristo. I m not particular about these five notes. Pay me in a different form. I wished from curiosity to take these, that I might be able to say that, without any advice or preparation, the house of Danglars had paid me five million without a minute's delay. It would have been remarkable. But here are your bonds. Pay me differently. And he held the bonds towards Danglars, who seized them like a vulture extending its claw to withhold the food that is being wrested from its grasp. Suddenly he rallied, made a violent effort to restrain himself, and then a smile gradually widened the features of his disturbed countenance. Certainly, he said, your receipt is money. Oh, dear, yes, and if you were at Rome, the house of Thompson in French would make no more difficulty about paying the money on my receipt than you have just done. Pardon me, Count, pardon me. Then I may keep this money? Yes, said Danglars. while the perspiration started from the roots of his hair. Yes, keep it, keep it. Monte Cristo replaced the notes in his pocket with that indescribable expression which seemed to say, Come reflect, if you repent there is still time. No, said Danglars, no, decidedly no, keep my signatures, but you know none are so formal as bankers in transacting business. I intended this money for the charity fund, and I seem to be robbing them if I did not pay them with these precise bonds. How absurd! As if one crown were not as good as another. Excuse me. And he began to laugh loudly but nervously. Certainly I excuse you, said Monte Cristo graciously, and pocket them. And he placed the bonds in his pocket book. But, said Danglars, there is still a sum of one hundred thousand francs. Oh, a mere nothing, said Monte Cristo. The balance would come to about that sum, but keep it and we shall be quits. Count, said Danglars, are you speaking seriously? I never joke with bankers, said Monte Cristo, in a freezing manner, which repelled impertinence, and he turned to the door just as the valet de chambre announced, Monsieur de Beauville, receiver général of the charities. Ma foi, said Monte Cristo, I think I arrived just in time to obtain your signatures, or they would have been disputed with me. Danglars again became pale, and hastened to conduct the count out. Monte Cristo exchanged a ceremonious bow with Monsieur de Beauville, who was standing in the waiting room, and who was introduced into Danglars' room as soon as the count had left. The count's sad face, Was illumined by a faint smile as he noticed the portfolio which the receiver general held in his hand. At the door he found his carriage and was immediately driven to the bank. Meanwhile, Danglars, repressing all emotion, advanced to meet the receiver general. We need not say that a smile of condescension was stamped upon his lips. Good morning, creditor, said he, for I wager anything it is the creditor who visits me. You are right, Baron, answered Monsieur de Beauville. The charities present themselves to you through me, 
the widows and orphans depute me to receive alms to the amount of five million from you. And yet they say orphans are to be pitied, said Danglars, wishing to prolong the jests. Poor things! Here I am in their name, said Monsieur de Beauville. But did you receive my letter yesterday? Yes. I have brought my receipt. My dear Monsieur de Beauville, your widows and orphans must oblige me by waiting twenty-four hours, since Monsieur de Monte Cristo, whom you just saw leaving here, you did see him, I think. Yes, well? Well, Monsieur de Monte Cristo has just carried off their five million. How so? The Count has an unlimited credit upon me, a credit opened by Thompson and French of Rome. He came to demand five million at once, which I paid him with checks on the bank. My funds are deposited there, and you can understand that if I draw out ten million on the same day, it will appear rather strange to the governor. Two days will be a different thing, said Danglars, smiling. Come, said Beauville, with a tone of entire incredulity. Five million to that gentleman who just left, and who bowed to me as though he knew me. Perhaps he knows you, though you do not know him. Monsieur de Monte Cristo knows everybody. Five million? Here is his receipt. Believe your own eyes. Monsieur de Beauville took the paper Danglars presented him and read. Received to Baron Danglars the sum of five million one hundred thousand francs, to be repaid on demand by the house of Thompson and French of Rome. It is really true, said Monsieur de Beauville. Yes, I once had business to transact with it to the amount of two hundred thousand francs, but since then I have not heard it mentioned. It is one of the best houses in Europe, said Danglars, carelessly throwing down the receipt on his desk. And he had five million in your hands alone? Why, this Count of Monte Cristo must be a nabob. Indeed, I do not know what he is. He has three unlimited credits one on me, one on Rothschild, one on Lafitte, and you see, he added carelessly, he has given me the preference by leaving a balance of one hundred thousand francs. M. de Beauville manifested signs of extraordinary admiration. I must visit him, he said, and obtain some pious grant from him. Oh, you may make sure of him. His charities alone amount to twenty thousand francs a month. It is magnificent. I will set before him the example of Madame de Morcerf and her son. What example? They gave all their fortune to the hospitals. What fortune? Their own. Monsieur de Morcerf's, who is deceased. For what reason? Because they would not spend money so guiltily acquired. And what are they living upon? The mother retires into the country, and the son enters the army. Well, I must confess, these are scruples. I registered their deed of gift yesterday. And how much did they possess? Oh, not much. From twelve to thirteen hundred thousand francs, but to return to our millions. Certainly, said Danglars, in the most natural tone in the world. Are you then pressed for this money? Yes, for the examination of our cash takes place to morrow. To morrow? Why did you not tell me so before? Why, it is as good as a century. And what hour does the examination take place? At two o'clock. Send at twelve, said Danglars, smiling. Monsieur de Beauville said nothing but nodded his head and took up the portfolio. Now I think of it, you can do better, said Danglars. How do you mean? The receipt of Monsieur de Monte Cristo is as good as money. Take it to Rothschild or Lafitte's, and they will take it off your hands at once. What, through payable at Rome? Certainly. It will only cost you a discount of five thousand or six thousand francs. The receiver started back. Ma foi, he said. I prefer waiting till to morrow. What a proposition! I thought perhaps, said Danglars with supreme impertinence, that you had a deficiency to make up? Indeed, said the receiver. And if that were the case, it would be worth while to make some sacrifice. Thank you, no, sir. Then it will be to morrow. Yes, but without fail. Ah, you're laughing at me. Send to morrow at twelve, and the bank shall be notified. I will come myself. Better still, since it will afford me the pleasure of seeing you. They shook hands. By the way, said Monsieur de Beauville, are you not going to the funeral of poor Mademoiselle de Villefort, which I met on my road here? No, said the banker. I have appeared rather ridiculous since that affair of Benedetto, so I remain in the background. Bah, you are wrong. 
How are you to blame in that affair? Listen, when one bears an irreproachable name as I do, one is rather sensitive. Everybody pities you, sir, and above all, Mademoiselle Danglars. Poor Eugenie, said Danglars, do you know she is going to embrace a religious life? No. Alas, it is unhappily but true. The day after the event she decided on leaving Paris with a nun on her acquaintance. They are gone to seek a very strict convent in Italy or Spain. Oh, it is terrible, said Monsieur de Beauville, retired with this exclamation, after expressing acute sympathy with the father. But he had scarcely left before Danglars, with an energy of action those can alone understand, who have seen Robert Marcel represented by Frederic, exclaimed, Fool! Then enclosing Monte Cristo's receipt in a little pocket book, he added, Yes, come at twelve o'clock, I shall then be far away. Then he double locked his door, emptied all his drawers, collected about fifty thousand francs in bank notes, burned several papers, left others exposed to view, and then commenced writing a letter which he addressed to Madame la Baronne d'Anglars. I will place it on her table myself to night, he murmured. Then taking a passport from his drawer, he said, Good it is available for two months longer. End of chapter 104 from the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Christine. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 105. The Cemetery of Père Lachaise. Mr. de Beauville had indeed met the funeral procession, which was taking Valentine to her last home on earth. The weather was dull and stormy, a cold wind shook the few remaining yellow leaves from the boughs of the trees and scattered them among the crowd which filled the boulevards. Mr. de Villefort, a true Parisian, considered the cemetery of Père Lachaise alone worthy of receiving the mortal remains of a Parisian family. There alone the corpses belonging to him would be surrounded by worthy associates. He had therefore purchased a vault, which was quickly occupied by members of his family. On the front of the monument was inscribed the families of St. Meran and Villefort, for such had been the last wish expressed by poor René, Valentine's mother. The pompous procession therefore wended its way towards Père la Chaise from the Faubourg St. Honor. Having crossed Paris, it passed through the Faubourg du Temple, then leaving the exterior boulevards, it reached the cemetery. More than fifty private carriages followed the twenty mourning coaches, and behind them more than five hundred persons joined in the procession on foot. These last consisted of all the young people, whom Valentine's death had struck like a thunderbolt and who, notwithstanding the raw chilliness of the season, could not refrain from paying a last tribute to the memory of the beautiful, chaste, and adorable girl, thus cut off in the flower of her youth. As they left Paris, an equipage with four horses at full speed was seen to draw up suddenly. It contained Monte Cristo. The Count left the carriage and mingled in the crowd who followed on foot. Chateau Renaud, perceived him, and immediately alighting from his coupé, joined him. The Count looked attentively through every opening in the crowd. He was evidently watching for someone, but his search ended in disappointment. "'Where is Morrel? he asked. "'Do either of these gentlemen know where he is?' "'We have already asked that question,' said Chatorino, "'for none of us has seen him.' The Count was silent, but continued to gaze around him. At length they arrived at the cemetery. The piercing eye of Monte Cristo glanced through a cluster of bushes and trees, and was soon relieved from all anxiety, for seeing a shadow glide between the yew trees, Monte Cristo recognized him whom he sought. 
One funeral is generally very much like another in this magnificent metropolis. Black figures are seen scattered over the long white avenues. The silence of earth and heaven is alone broken by the noise made by the crackling branches of hedges planted around the monuments. Then follows the melancholy chant of the priests, mingled now and then with a sob of anguish, escaping from some woman concealed behind a mass of flowers. The shadow Monte Cristo had noticed passed rapidly behind the tomb of Abelard and Heloise, placed itself close to the heads of the horses belonging to the hearse, and following the undertaker's men, arrived with them at the spot appointed for the burial. Each person's attention was occupied. Monte Cristo saw nothing but the shadow, which no one else observed. Twice the Count left the ranks to see whether the object of his interest had any concealed weapon beneath his clothes. When the procession stopped, this shadow was recognized as Morel, who, with his coat buttoned up to his throat, his face livid, and convulsively crushing his head between his fingers, leaned against a tree, situated on an elevation commanding the mausoleum, so that none of the funeral details could escape his observation. Everything was conducted in the usual manner. A few men, the least impressed of all by the scene, pronounced a discourse, some deploring this premature death, others expatiating on the grief of the father, and one very ingenious person quoting the fact that Valentine had solicited pardon of her father for criminals on whom the arm of justice was ready to fall, until at length they exhausted their stores of metaphor and mournful speeches. Monte Cristo heard and saw nothing, or rather he only saw Morel, whose calmness had a frightful effect on those who knew what was passing in his heart. See, said Bechamp, pointing out Morel to Debris, what is he doing up there? And they called Chateau Renaud's attention to him. How pale he is, said Chateau Renaud, shuddering. He is cold, said Debris. Not at all, said Chateau Renaud slowly. I think he is violently agitated. He is very susceptible. Bah, said Debris, he scarcely knew Mademoiselle de Villefort. You said so yourself. True. Still I remember he danced three times with her at Madame de Morcerf's. Do you recollect that ball count, where you produced such an effect? No, I do not, replied Monte Cristo, without even knowing of what or to whom he was speaking. So much was he occupied in watching Morel, who was holding his breath with emotion. The discourse is over. Farewell, gentlemen, said the count. And he disappeared without anyone seeing whither he went. The funeral being over, the guests returned to Paris. Chateau Renaud looked for a moment for Morel, but while they were watching the departure of the Count, Morel had quitted his post, and Chateau Renaud, failing in his search, joined Debris and Bechamp. Monte Cristo concealed himself behind a large tomb and awaited the arrival of Morel, who by degrees approached the tomb, now abandoned by spectators and workmen. Morel threw a glance around. But before it reached the spot occupied by Monte Cristo, the latter had advanced yet nearer, still unperceived. The young man kneeled down. The count, with outstretched neck and glaring eyes, stood in an attitude ready to pounce upon Morel upon the first occasion. Morel bent his head till it touched the stone. Then, clutching the grating with both hands, he murmured, Oh, Valentine! The Count's heart was pierced by the utterance of these two words. He stepped forward, and touching the young man's shoulder, said, I was looking for you, my friend. Monte Cristo expected a burst of passion, but he was deceived, for Morrow, turning around, said calmly, You see, I was praying. The scrutinizing glance of the Count searched the young man from head to foot. He then seemed more easy. "'Shall I drive you back to Paris?' he asked. "'No, thank you.' "'Do you wish anything?' "'Leave me to pray.' The Count withdrew without opposition, but it was only to place himself in a situation where he could watch every movement of Morel, who at length arose, brushed the dust from his knees, and turned towards Paris, without once looking back. He walked slowly down the Rue de la Raquette. The Count, dismissing his carriage followed him about a hundred paces behind. Maximilian crossed the canal and entered the Rue Meslay, 
by the boulevards. Five minutes after the door had been closed on Morrow's entrance, it was again opened for the count. Julie was at the entrance of the garden, where she was attentively watching Penelon, who, entering with zeal into his profession of gardener, was very busy crafting some Bengal roses. "'Ah, Count!' she exclaimed, with the delight manifested by every member of the family whenever he visited the room Miss Lay. "'Maximilian has just returned, has he not, madame?' asked the Count. "'Yes, I think I saw him pass, but pray call Emmanuel.' "'Excuse me, madame, but I must go up to Maximilian's room this instant,' replied Monte Cristo. "'I have something of the greatest importance to tell him.' "'Go, then,' she said with a charming smile, which accompanied him until he had disappeared. Monte Cristo soon ran up the staircase, conducting from the ground floor to Maximilian's room. He listened attentively, but all was still. Like many old houses occupied by a single family— the room door was panelled with glass, but it was locked. Maximilian was shut in, and it was impossible to see what was passing in the room, because a red curtain was drawn before the glass. The Count's anxiety was manifested by a bright colour which seldom appeared on the face of that imperturbable man. "'What shall I do?' he uttered, and reflected for a moment. "'Shall I ring? No, the sound of a bell announcing a visitor— will but accelerate the resolution of one in Maximilian's situation, and then the bell would be followed by a louder noise. Monte Cristo trembled from head to foot, and as if his determination had been taken with the rapidity of lightning, he struck one of the panes of glass with his elbow. The glass was shivered to atoms, then withdrawing the curtain he saw Morrow, who had been writing at his desk, bound from his seat at the noise of the broken window. "'I beg a thousand pardons,' said the Count. "'There is nothing the matter, but I slipped down and broke one of your panes of glass with my elbow. "'Since it is opened, I will take advantage of it to enter your room. "'Do not disturb yourself. Do not disturb yourself.' "'And passing his hand through the broken glass, the Count opened the door. "'Moral, evidently discomposed, came to meet Monte Cristo, "'less with the intention of receiving him than to exclude his entry.' Ma foy, said Monte Cristo, rubbing his elbow, it's all your servant's fault. Your stairs are so polished it is like walking on glass. Are you hurt, sir? coldly asked Morrow. I believe not. But what are you about there? You were writing. I. Your fingers are stained with ink. Ah, true, I was writing. I do sometimes, soldier, though I am. Monte Cristo advanced into the room. Maximilian was obliged to let him pass, but he followed him. "'You were writing,' said Monte Cristo with a searching look. "'I have already had the honour of telling you I was,' said Morrow. The Count looked around him. "'Your pistols are beside your desk,' said Monte Cristo, pointing with his finger to the pistols on the table." "'I am on the point of starting on a journey,' replied Morrow disdainfully. "'My friend,' exclaimed Monte Cristo in a tone of exquisite sweetness. "'Sir?' "'My friend, my dear Maximilian, do not make a hasty resolution, I entreat you.' "'I make a hasty resolution,' said Morrow, shrugging his shoulders. "'Is there anything extraordinary in a journey?' Maximilian, said the Count, let us both lay aside the mask we have assumed. You no more deceive me with that false calmness than I impose upon you with my frivolous solicitude. You can understand, can you not, that to have acted as I have done, to have broken that glass, to have intruded on the solitude of a friend, you can understand that, to have done all this, I must have been actuated by real uneasiness, or rather by a terrible conviction, moral, you are going to destroy yourself. Indeed, Count, said Morrow, shuddering, what has put this into your head? I tell you that you are about to destroy yourself, continued the Count, and here is proof of what I say. And, approaching the desk, he removed the sheet of paper which Morrow had placed over the letter he had begun, and took the letter in his hands. Morrow rushed forward to tear it from him, but Monte Cristo, perceiving his intention, seized his wrist with his iron grasp. "'You wish to destroy yourself,' said the Count. 
you have written it. Well, said Morrell, changing his expression of calmness for one of violence. Well, and if I do intend to turn this pistol against myself, who shall prevent me? Who will dare prevent me? All my hopes are blighted. My heart is broken, my life a burden. Everything around me is sad and mournful. Earth has become distasteful to me, and human voices distract me. It's a mercy to let me die, for if I live I shall lose my reason and become mad. When, sir, I tell you, all this with tears of heartfelt anguish, can you reply that I am wrong? Can you prevent my putting an end to my miserable existence? Tell me, sir, could you have the courage to do so? Yes, Morrow, said Monte Cristo with a calmness which contrasted strangely with the young man's excitement. Yes, I would do so. You, exclaimed Morrow, with increasing anger and reproach. You, who have deceived me with false hopes, who have cheered and soothed me with vain promises, when I might, if not have saved her, at least have seen her die in my arms. You, who pretend to understand everything, even the hidden sources of knowledge, and who enact the part of a guardian angel upon earth, and could not even find an antidote to a poison administered to a young girl. Ah, sir, indeed you would inspire me with pity, were you not hateful in my eyes. Moral. Yes, you tell me to lay aside the mask, and I will do so. Be satisfied. When you spoke to me at the cemetery, I answered you. My heart was softened when you arrived here. I allowed you to enter. But since you abuse my confidence, since you have devised a new torture after I thought I had exhausted them all, then, Count of Monte Cristo, my pretended benefactor, then, Count of Monte Cristo, the universal guardian, be satisfied. You shall witness the death of your friend. And Morrow, with a maniacal laugh, again rushed towards the pistols. And I again repeat, you shall not commit suicide. Prevent me, then, replied Morrow, with another struggle which, like the first, failed in releasing him from the Count's iron grasp. I will prevent you. And who are you, then, that arrogate to yourself this tyrannical right over free and rational beings? Who am I? repeated Monte Cristo. Listen, I am the only man in the world having the right to say to you, Moral, your father's son shall not die today. And Monte Cristo, with an expression of majesty and sublimity, advanced with arms folded towards the young man, who, involuntarily overcome by the commanding manner of this man, recalled a step. Why do you mention my father? stammered he. Why do you mingle a recollection of him with the affairs of today? Because I am he who saved your father's life when he wished to destroy himself, as you do today. Because I am the man who sent the purse to your young sister, and the pharaoh to old Morel. Because I am the Edmond Dantes who nursed you a child on my knees. Morel made another step back, staggering, breathless, crushed. Then all his strength gave way, and he fell prostrate at the feet of Monte Cristo. Then his admirable nature underwent a complete and sudden revulsion. He arose, rushed out of the room and to the stairs, exclaiming energetically, Julie, Julie, Emmanuel, Emmanuel! Monte Cristo endeavored also to leave, but Maximilian would have died rather than relax his hold of the handle of the door, which he closed upon the count. Julie, Emmanuel, and some of the servants ran up in alarm on hearing the cries of Maximilian. Morel seized their hands, and opening the door exclaimed in a voice choked with sobs, On your knees! On your knees! He is our benefactor, the saviour of our father! He is... He would have added Edmond Dantes, but the Count seized his arm and prevented him. Julie threw herself into the arms of the Count. Emmanuel embraced him as a guardian angel. Morel again fell on his knees and struck the ground with his forehead. Then the iron-hearted man felt his heart swell in his breast. A flame seemed to rush from his throat to his eyes. He bent his head and wept. For a while nothing was heard in the room but a succession of sobs, while the incense, 
from their grateful hearts mounted to heaven. Julie had scarcely recovered from her deep emotion when she rushed out of the room, descended to the next floor, ran into the drawing room with childlike joy, and raised the crystal globe which covered the purse given by the unknown of the Alice de Milan. Meanwhile, Emmanuel, in a broken voice, said to the Count, O oh, Count, why, how could you, hearing us so often speak of our unknown benefactor, seeing us pay such homage of gratitude and adoration to his memory, how could you continue so long without discovering yourself to us? Oh, it was cruel to us, and, dare I say it, to you also. Listen, my friends, said the Count, I may call you so, since we have really been friends for the last eleven years. The discovery of the secret has been occasioned by a great event which you must never know. I wish to bury it during my whole life in my own bosom, but your brother Maximilian wrested it from me by a violence he repents of now, I am sure. Then, turning around and seeing that moral, still on his knees, had thrown himself into an armchair, he added in a low voice, pressing Emmanuel's hand significantly, Watch over him. Why so? asked the young man, surprised. I cannot explain myself, but watch over him. Emmanuel looked around the room and caught sight of the pistols. His eyes rest on the weapons, and he pointed to them. Monte Cristo bent his head. Emmanuel went towards the pistols. Leave them, said Monte Cristo. Then walking towards Morel, he took his hand. The tumultuous agitation of the my young man was succeeded by a profound stupor. Julie returned, holding the silken purse in her hands, while tears of joy rolled down her cheeks like dewdrops on the rose. Here is the relic, she said. Do not think it will be less dear to us now we are acquainted with our benefactor. My child, said Monte Cristo, colouring, allow me to take back that purse. Since you now know my face, I wish to be remembered alone through the affection I hope you will grant me. Oh, said Julie, pressing the purse to her heart. No, no, I beseech you, do not take it. For some unhappy day you will leave us, will you not? You have guessed rightly, madame, replied Monte Cristo, smiling. In a week I shall have left this country, where so many persons who merit the vengeance of heaven lived happily while my father perished of hunger and grief. While announcing his departure, the Count fixed it, his eyes on Morel and remarked that the words, I shall have left this country, had failed to rouse him from his lethargy. He then saw that he must make another struggle against the grief of his friend, and taking the hands of Emmanuel and Julie, which he pressed with his own, he said with the mild authority of a father, My kind friends, Leave me alone with Maximilian. Julie saw the means offered of carrying off her precious relic, which Monte Cristo had forgotten. She drew her husband to the door. Let us leave them, she said. The Count was alone with Morel, who remained motionless as a statue. Come, said Monte Cristo, touching his shoulder with his finger. Are you a man again, Maximilian? Yes, for I begin to suffer again. The Count frowned, apparently in gloomy hesitation. Maximilian, Maximilian, he said, the ideas you yield to are unworthy of a Christian. Oh, do not fear, my friend, said Morel, raising his head and smiling with a sweet expression on the Count. I shall no longer attempt my life. Then we are to have no more pistols, no more despair? No, I have found a better remedy for my grief than either a bullet or a knife. Poor fellow, what is it? My grief will kill me of itself. My friend, said Monte Cristo, with an expression of melancholy equal to his own, listen to me. One day, in a moment of despair like yours, since it led to a similar resolution, I also wished to kill myself. One day your father, equally desperate, wished to kill himself too. If any one had said to your father at the moment he raised the pistol to his head, if any one had told me when in my prison I pushed back the food I had not tasted for three days, if any one had said to either of us then, Live, 
the day will come when you will be happy and will bless life no matter whose voice had spoken we should have heard him with the smile of doubt or the anguish of incredulity and yet how many times has your father blessed life while embracing you how often have i myself ah exclaimed morel interrupting the count you had only lost your liberty my father had only lost his fortune but i have lost valentin look at me said monte cristo with that expression which sometimes made him so eloquent and persuasive look at me there are no tears in my eyes nor is there fever in my veins yet i see you suffer you maximilian whom i love as my own son well does not this tell you that in grief as in life there is always something to look forward to beyond no if i entreat if i order you to live morrow it is in the conviction that one day you will thank me for having preserved your life oh heavens said the young man oh heavens what are you saying count take care but perhaps you have never loved child replied the count i mean as i love you see i have been a soldier ever since i attained manhood i reached the age of twenty-nine without loving for none of the feelings i before then experienced merit the appellation of love well at twenty-nine i saw valentine for two years i have loved her for two years i have seen written in her heart as in a book all the virtues of a daughter and wife count to possess valentine would have been a happiness too infinite too ecstatic too complete too divine for this world since it has been denied me but without valentine the earth is desolate i have told you to hope said the count then have a care i repeat for you seek to persuade me and if you succeed i should lose my reason for i should hope that i could again behold valentine the count smiled my friend my father said morel with excitement have a care i again repeat for the power you wield over me alarms me weigh your words before you speak for my eyes have already become brighter and my heart beats strongly be cautious or you will make me believe in supernatural agencies i must obey you though you bade me call forth the dead or walk upon the water hope my friend repeated the count ah said morel falling from the height of excitement to the abyss of despair ah you are playing with me like those good or rather selfish mothers who soothe their children with honeyed words because their screams annoy them now my friend i was wrong to caution you do not fear i will bury my grief so deep in my heart i will disguise it so that you shall not even care to sympathize with me adieu my friend adieu on the contrary said the count after this time you must live with me you must not leave me and in a week we shall have left france behind us and you still bid me hope i tell you to hope because i have a method of curing you count you render me sadder than before if it be possible you think the result of this blow had been to produce an ordinary grief and you could cure it by an ordinary remedy change of scene and morel dropped his head with disdainful incredulity what can i say more asked monte cristo i have confidence in the remedy i propose and only ask you to permit me to assure you of its efficiency count you prolong my agony then said the count your feeble spirit will not even grant me the trial i request come do you know of what the count of monte cristo is capable do you know that he holds terrestrial beings under his control nay that he can almost work a miracle well wait for the miracle i hope to accomplish or or repeated morel or take care morel lest i call you ungrateful have pity on me count i feel so much pity towards you maximilian that listen to me attentively if i do not cure you in a month to the day to the very hour mark my words moral i will place loaded pistols before you 
and a cup of the deadliest Italian poison, a poison more sure and prompt than that which has killed Valentine. Will you promise me? Yes, for I am a man, and have suffered like yourself, and also contemplated suicide. Indeed, often since misfortune has left me, I have longed for the delights of an eternal sleep. But you are sure you will promise me this? said Morel, intoxicated. I not only promise, but swear it, said Monte Cristo, extending his hand. In a month, then, on your honour, if I am not consoled, you will let me take my life into my own hands, and whatever may happen, you will not call me ungrateful? In a month, to the day, the very hour and the date are sacred, Maximilian. I do not know whether you remember that that this is the 5th of September. It is ten years to-day since I saved your father's life, who wished to die. Morel seized the Count's hand and kissed it. The Count allowed him to pay the homage he felt due to him. In a month you will find on the table, at which we shall be then sitting, good pistols and a delicious draught. But, on the other hand, you must promise me not to attempt your life before that time. Oh, I also swear it. Monte Cristo drew the young man towards him and pressed him for some time to his heart. And now, he said, after today you will come and live with me. You can occupy Heidi's apartment, and my daughter will at least be replaced by my son. Heidi, said Morel, what has become of her? She departed last night. To leave you? To wait for me. Hold yourself ready, then, to join me at the Champs Elysees, and lead me out of this house without anyone seeing my departure. Maximilian hung his head, and obeyed with childlike reverence. End of chapter 105《Chapter 106 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 106 Dividing the Proceeds. The apartment on the second floor of the house in the Rue Saint Germain des Prés where Albert de Montserf had selected a home for his mother, was led to a very mysterious person. This was a man whose face the concierge himself had never seen, for in the winter his chin was buried in one of the large red handkerchiefs worn by gentlemen's coachmen on a cold night, and in the summer he made a point of always blowing his nose when he approached the door. Contrary to custom, this gentleman had not been watched, for as the report ran that he was a person of high rank, and one who would allow no impertinent interference, his incognito was strictly respected. His visits were tolerably regular, though occasionally he appeared a little before or after his time, but generally, both in summer and winter, he took possession of his apartment about four o'clock, though he never spent the night there. At half-past three in the winter, the fire was lighted by the discreet servant, who had the superintendence of the little apartment, and in the summer ices were placed on the table at the same hour. At four o'clock, as we have already stated, the mysterious personage arrived. Twenty minutes afterwards, a carriage stopped at the house. A lady alighted in a black or dark blue dress, and always thickly veiled. She passed like a shadow through the lodge, and ran upstairs, without a sound escaping under the touch of her light foot. No one ever asked her where she was going. Her face, therefore, like that of the gentleman, was perfectly unknown to the two concierges, who were perhaps unequalled throughout the capital for discretion. We need not say she stopped at the second floor. Then she tapped in a peculiar manner at a door, which after being opened to admit her, was again fastened, and curiosity penetrated no farther. They used the same precautions in leaving as in entering the house. The lady always left first, and as soon as she had stepped into her carriage, it drove away, sometimes towards the right hand, sometimes to the left. Then about twenty minutes afterwards, 
the gentleman would also leave, buried in his cravat or concealed by his handkerchief. The day after Monte Cristo had called upon Danglars, the mysterious lodger entered at ten o'clock in the morning instead of four in the afternoon. Almost directly afterwards, without the usual interval of time, a cab arrived, and the veiled lady ran hastily upstairs. The door opened, but before it could be closed the lady exclaimed, Oh Lucien, oh my friend! The concierge therefore heard for the first time that the lodger's name was Lucien. Still, as he was the very perfection of a doorkeeper, he made up his mind not to tell his wife. Well, what is the matter, my dear? asked the gentleman, whose name the lady's agitation revealed. Tell me, what is the matter? Oh Lucien, can I confide in you? Of course, you know you can do so. But what can be the matter? Your note of this morning has completely bewildered me. This precipitation, this unusual appointment. Come, ease me of my anxiety, or else frighten me at once. Lucien, a great event has happened, said the lady, glancing inquiringly at Lucien. Monsieur Danglars left last night. Left? Monsieur Danglars left? Where has he gone? I don't know. What do you mean? Has he gone, intending not to return? Undoubtedly. At ten o'clock at night, his horses took him to the barrier of Charenton. There a post-chaise was waiting for him. He entered it with a valet de chambre, saying that he was going to Fontainebleau. Then what did you mean? Stay. He left a letter for me. A letter? Yes, read it and the baroness took from her pocket a letter which she gave to Debray. Debray paused for a moment before reading, as if trying to guess its content, or perhaps while making up his mind how to act, whatever it might contain. No doubt his ideas were arranged in a few minutes, for he began reading the letter which caused so much uneasiness in the heart of the baroness, and which ran as follows. Madame and most faithful wife. Debray mechanically stopped and looked at the baroness, whose face had become covered with blushes. Read, she said. Debray continued. When you receive this, you will no longer have a husband. Oh, you need not be alarmed. You will only have lost him as you have lost your daughter. I mean that I shall be travelling on one of the thirty or forty roads leading out of France. I owe you some explanations for my conduct, and as you are a woman that can perfectly understand me, I will give them. Listen, then. I received this morning five millions which I paid away, almost directly afterwards another demand for the same sum was presented to me. I put this creditor off till tomorrow, and I intend leaving today to escape that tomorrow, which would be rather too unpleasant for me to endure. You understand this, do you not, my most precious wife? I say you understand this, because you are as conversant in my affairs as I am. Indeed, I think you understand them better since I am ignorant of what has become of a considerable portion of my fortune, once very tolerable, while I am sure, madame, that you know perfectly well. For women have infallible instincts. They can even explain the marvelous by an algebraic calculation they have invented. But I, who only understand my own figures, know nothing more than that one day these figures deceived me. Have you admired the rapidity of my fall? Have you been slightly dazzled at the sudden fusion of my ingots? I confess I have seen nothing but the fire. Let us hope you have found some gold among the ashes. With this consoling idea I leave you, madame and most prudent wife, without any conscientious reproach for abandoning you. You have friends left, and the ashes I have already mentioned, and above all the liberty I hasten to restore to you. And here, madame, I must add another word of explanation. So long as I hoped you were working for the good of our house and for the fortune of our daughter, I philosophically closed my eyes. But as you have transformed that house into a vast ruin, I will not be the foundation of another man's fortune. You were rich when I married you, but little respected. Excuse me for speaking so very candidly, but as this is intended only for ourselves, I do not see why I should weigh my words. I have augmented our fortune, and it has continued to increase during the last fifteen years, till extraordinary and unexpected catastrophes have suddenly overturned it, without any fault of mine, I can honestly declare. You, madame, have only sought to increase your own, and I am convinced that you have succeeded. I leave you, therefore, as I took you, 
rich but little respected. Adieu. I also intend from this time to work on my own account. Accept my acknowledgments for the example you have set me, and which I intend following. Your very devoted husband, Baron d'Anglars. The Baroness had watched Debray while he read this long and painful letter, and saw him, notwithstanding his self-control, change color once or twice. When he had ended the perusal, he folded the letter and resumed his pensive attitude. Well, asked Madame Langlard, with an anxiety easy to be understood. Well, Madame, unhesitatingly repeated Debray, with what ideas does this letter inspire you? Oh, it is simple enough, Madame. It inspires me with the idea that Monsieur Danglars has left suspiciously. Certainly. But is this all you have to say to me? I do not understand you, said Debray, with freezing coldness. He is gone, gone, never to return. Oh, Madame, do not think that. I tell you, he will never return. I know his character. He is inflexible in any resolutions formed for his own interests. If he could have made any use of me, he would have taken me with him. He leaves me in Paris, as our separation will conduce to his benefit. Therefore he has gone, and I am free forever, added Madame Danglars, in the same supplicating tone. Debray, instead of answering, allowed her to remain in an attitude of nervous inquiry. Well, she said at length, do you not answer me? I have but one question to ask you. What do you intend to do? I was going to ask you, replied the baroness with a beating heart. Ah, then you wish to ask advice of me. Yes, I do wish to ask of your advice, said Madame Danglars with anxious expectation. Then if you wish to take my advice, said the young man coldly, I would recommend you to travel. To travel, she murmured. Certainly. As Monsieur Danglars says, you are rich and perfectly free. In my opinion, a withdrawal from Paris is absolutely necessary, after the double catastrophe of Mademoiselle Danglars' broken contract and Monsieur Danglars' disappearance. The world will think you abandoned and poor, for the wife of a bankrupt would never be forgiven were she to keep up an appearance of opulence. You have only to remain in Paris for about a fortnight, telling the world you are abandoned, and relating the details of this desertion to your best friends, who will soon spread the report. Then you can quit your house, leaving your jewels and giving up your jointure, and everyone's mouth will be filled with praises of your disinterestedness. They will know you are deserted, and think you also poor, for I alone know your real financial position, and am quite ready to give up my accounts as an honest partner. The dread with which the pale and motionless baroness listened to this was equaled by the calm indifference with which Debray had spoken. Deserted, she repeated. Ah, yes, I am indeed deserted. You are right, sir, and no one can doubt my position. These were the only words that this proud and violently enamored woman could utter in response to Debray. But then you are rich, very rich indeed, continued Debray, taking out some papers from his pocket book, which he spread upon the table. Madame Danglars did not see them. She was engaged in stilling the beatings of her heart and restraining the tears which were ready to gush forth. At length, a sense of dignity prevailed, and if she did not entirely master her agitation, she at least succeeded in preventing the fall of a single tear. Madame, said Debray, it is nearly six months since we have been associated. You furnished a principal of hundred thousand francs. Our partnership began in the month of April. In May we commenced operations, and in the course of the month gained four hundred fifty thousand francs. In June the profit amounted to nine hundred thousand. In July we added 1,700,000 francs. It was, you know, the month of the Spanish bonds. In August we lost 300,000 francs at the beginning of the month, but on the 13th we made up for it, and we now find that our accounts, reckoning from the first day of partnership up to yesterday when I closed them, showed a capital of 2,400,000 francs, that is 1,200,000 for each of us. Now Madame said Debray, delivering up his accounts in the methodical manner of a stockbroker, there are still 80,000 francs, the interest of this money, in my hands. But, said the Baroness, I thought you never put the money out to interest. Excuse me, Madame, said Debray coldly. I had your permission to do so, and I have made use of it. 
There are then 40,000 francs for your share, besides the 100,000 you furnished me to begin with, making in all 1,340,000 francs for your portion. Now, madame, I took the precaution of drawing out your money the day before yesterday. It is not long ago, you see, and I was in continual expectation of being called on to deliver up my accounts. There is your money, half in banknotes, the other half in checks payable to bearer. I say there, for as I did not consider my house safe enough, or lawyers sufficiently discreet, and as landed property carries evidence with it, and moreover since you have no right to possess anything independent of your husband, I have kept this sum, now your whole fortune, in a chest concealed under that closet, and for greater security I myself concealed it there. Now, madame, continued Debray, first opening the closet, then the chest. Now, madame, here are eight hundred notes of one thousand francs each, resembling, as you see, a large book bound in iron. To this I add a certificate in the funds of twenty-five thousand francs. Then, for the odd cash, making, I think, about one hundred and ten thousand francs, here is a check upon my banker who, not being Monsieur Donglas, will pay you the amount, you may rest assured. Madame Donglas mechanically took the check, the bond, and the heap of banknotes. This enormous fortune made no great appearance on the table. Madame Donglas, with tearless eyes, and with her breast heaving with concealed emotion, placed the banknotes in her bag, put the certificate and check into her pocket-book, and then, standing pale and mute, awaited one kind word of consolation. But she waited in vain. Now, madame, said Debray, you have a splendid fortune, an income of about sixty thousand livres a year, which is enormous for a woman who cannot keep an establishment here for a year at least. You will be able to indulge all your fancies. Besides, should you find your income insufficient, you can, for the sake of the past, madame, make use of mine, and I am ready to offer you all I possess, on loan. Thank you, sir, thank you, replied the baroness. You forget that what you have just paid me is much more than a poor woman requires, who intends, for some time at least, to retire from the world. Debray was for a moment surprised, but immediately recovering himself, he bowed with an air which seemed to say, As you please, madame. Madame Donglars had until then perhaps hoped for something, but when she saw the careless bow of Debray and the glance by which it was accompanied, together with a significant silence, she raised her head, and without passion or violence or even hesitation, ran downstairs, disdaining to address a last farewell to one who could thus part from her. But, said Debray, when she left, these are fine projects. She will remain at home, read novels, and speculate at cards, since she can no longer do so on the bourse. Then, taking up his account book, he cancelled with the greatest care all the entries of the amounts he had just paid away. I have one million sixty thousand francs remaining, he said. What a pity Mademoiselle de Villefort is dead. She suited me in every respect, and I would have married her and he calmly waited until the twenty minutes had elapsed after Madame Donglas' departure, before he left the house. During this time he occupied himself in making figures with his watch by his side. Asmodeus, that diabolical personage who would have been created by every fertile imagination if Le Sage had not acquired the priority in his great masterpiece, would have enjoyed a singular spectacle if he had lifted up the roof of the little house in the Rue Saint-Germain-des-Prés while Debray was casting up his figures. Above the room in which Debray had been dividing two millions and a half with Madame Danglars was another, inhabited by persons who have played too prominent a part in the incidents we have related, for their appearance not to create some interest. Mercedes and Albert were in that room. Mercedes was much changed within the last few days. Not that even in her days of fortune she had ever dressed with a magnificent display which makes us no longer able to recognize a woman when she appears in a plain and simple attire, nor indeed had she fallen into that state of depression where it is impossible to conceal the garb of misery. No, the change in Mercedes was that her eye no longer sparkled, her lips no longer smiled, and there was now a hesitation in uttering the words which formerly sprang so fluently from her ready wit. It was not poverty which had broken her spirit, it was not a want of courage which rendered her poverty burdensome. Mercedes, although deposed from the exalted position she had occupied, lost in the sphere she had now chosen, 
like a person passing from a room splendidly lighted into utter darkness, appeared like a queen fallen from her palace to a hovel, and who, reduced to strict necessity, could neither become reconciled to the earthen vessels she was herself forced to place upon the table, nor to the humble pallet which had become her bed. The beautiful Catalan and noble countess had lost both her proud glance and charming smile, because she saw nothing but misery around her. The walls were hung with one of the grey papers which economical landlords choose as not likely to show the dirt. The floor was uncarpeted, the furniture attracted the attention to the poor attempt at luxury. Indeed everything offended eyes accustomed to refinement and elegance. Madame de Montcel had lived there since leaving her house. The continual silence of the spot oppressed her. Still, seeing that Albert continually watched her countenance to judge the state of her feelings, she constrained herself to assume a monotonous smile of the lips alone, which contrasted with a sweet and beaming expression that usually shone from her eyes, seemed like moonlight on a statue, yielding light without warmth. Albert, too, was ill at ease. The remains of luxury prevented him from sinking into his actual position. If he wished to go out without gloves, his hands appeared too white. If he wished to walk through the town, his boots seemed too highly polished. Yet these two noble and intelligent creatures, united by the indissoluble ties of the maternal and filial love, had succeeded in tacitly understanding one another, and economizing their stores, and Albert had been able to tell his mother without extorting a change of countenance, Mother, we have no more money. Mercedes had never known misery. She had often in her youth spoken of poverty, but between want and necessity, those synonymous words, there is a wide difference. Amongst the Catalans, Mercedes wished for a thousand things, but still she never really wanted any. So long as the nets were good, they caught fish, and so long as they sold their fish, they were able to buy twine for new nets. And then, shut out from friendship, Having but one affection which could not be mixed up with her ordinary pursuits, she thought of herself, of no one but herself. Upon the little she earned, she lived as well as she could. Now there were two to be supported, and nothing to live upon. Winter approached. Mercedes had no fire in that cold and naked room. She, who was accustomed to stoves which heated the house from the hall to the boudoir, she had not even one little flower she whose apartment had been a conservatory of costly exotics. But she had her son. Hitherto the excitement of fulfilling a duty had sustained them. Excitement like enthusiasm sometimes renders us unconscious to the things of earth. But the excitement had calmed down, and they felt themselves obliged to descend from dreams to reality. After having exhausted the ideal, they found that they must talk of the actual. Mother, exclaimed Albert, just as Madame Danglars was descending the stairs. Let us reckon our riches, if you please. I want capital to build my plans upon. Capital? Nothing, replied Mercedes with a mournful smile. No, mother. Capital three thousand francs. And I have an idea of leading a delightful life upon this three thousand francs. Child, sighed Mercedes. Alas, dear mother, said the young man, I have unhappily spent too much of your money not to know the value of it. These three thousand francs are enormous, and I intend building upon this foundation a miraculous certainty for the future. You say this, my dear boy, but do you think we ought to accept these three thousand francs, said Mercedes, coloring? I think so, answered Albert in a firm tone. We will accept them the more readily since we have them not here. You know they are buried in the garden of the little house in the Allée des Meillons at Marseille. With two hundred francs we can reach Marseille. With two hundred francs? Are you sure, Albert? Oh, as for that, I have made inquiries respecting the diligences and steamboats, and my calculations are made. You will take your place in the coupé to Chalon. You see, mother, I treat you handsomely for thirty-five francs. Albert then took a pen and wrote, Coupé, thirty-five francs. From Chalon to Lyon, you will go on by the steamboat, six francs. 
from Lyon to Avignon, still by steamboat, 16 francs, from Avignon to Marseille, 7 francs, expenses on the road, about 50 francs, total, 114 francs. Let us put down 120, added Albert, smiling. You see, I am generous, am I not, mother? But you, my poor child, I, do you not see that I reserve 80 francs for myself? A young man does not require luxuries. Besides, I know what traveling is. With a post-chaise and valet de chambre? Anyway, mother. Well, be it so. But these two hundred francs? Here they are, and two hundred more besides. See, I have sold my watch for one hundred francs, and the guard and seals for three hundred. How fortunate that the ornaments were worth more than the watch. Still the same story of superfluities. Now I think we are rich, since instead of the 114 francs we require for the journey, we find ourselves in possession of 250. But we owe something in this house. 30 francs, but I pay that out of my 150 francs. That is understood. And as I require only 80 francs for my journey, you see I am overwhelmed with luxury. But that is not all. What do you say to this, mother? And Albert took out of a little pocket book with golden clasps, a remnant of his old fancies, or perhaps a tender souvenir from one of the mysterious and veiled ladies who used to knock at his little door. Albert took out of this pocket book a note of a thousand francs. What is this? asked Mercedes. A thousand francs. But whence have you obtained them? Listen to me, mother, and do not yield too much to agitation and Albert, rising, kissed his mother on both cheeks, then stood looking at her. "'You cannot imagine, mother, how beautiful I think you,' said the young man, impressed with a profound feeling of filial love. "'You are indeed the most beautiful and most noble woman I ever saw.' "'Dear child,' said Mercedes, endeavouring in vain to restrain a tear which glistened in the corner of her eye. "'Indeed, you only wanted misfortune to change my love for you to admiration. I am not unhappy while I possess my son. Ah, just so, said Albert, here begins the trial. Do you know the decision we have to come to, mother? Have we come to any? Yes, it is decided that you are to live at Marseille, and that I am to leave for Africa, where I will earn for myself the right to use the name I now bear, instead of one I have thrown aside. Mercedes sighed. Well, mother, I yesterday engaged myself as substitute in the Spahis, added the young man, lowering his eyes with a certain feeling of shame, for even he was unconscious of the sublimity of his self-abasement. I thought my body was my own, and that I might sell it. I yesterday took the place of another. I sold myself for more than I thought I was worth, he added, attempting to smile. I fetched two thousand francs. Footnote, the Spahis are French cavalry reserved for service in Africa. Then these one thousand francs, said Mercedes, shuddering, are the half of the sum, mother, the other will be paid in a year. Mercedes raised her eyes to heaven with an expression it would be impossible to describe, and tears, which had hitherto been restrained, now yielded to her emotion and ran down her cheeks. The price of his blood, she murmured. Yes, if I am killed, said Albert, laughing. But I assure you, mother, I have a strong intention of defending my person, and I never felt half so strong an inclination to live as I do now. Merciful heavens! Besides, mother, why should you make up your mind that I am to be killed? Has La Mauricière, that nay of the south, been killed? Has Jean Garnier been killed? Has Bedeau been killed? Has Morel, whom we know, been killed? Think of your joy, mother, when you see me return with an embroidered uniform. I declare I expect to look magnificent in it, and chose that regiment only from vanity. Mercedes sighed while endeavoring to smile. The devoted mother felt that she ought not to allow the whole weight of the sacrifice to fall upon her son. Well, now you understand, mother, continued Albert. Here are more than four thousand francs settled on you. Upon these you can live at least two years. Do you think so? said Mercedes. These words were uttered in so mournful a tone that their real meaning did not escape Albert. He felt his heart beat, 
and taking his mother's hand within his own, he said tenderly, Yes, you will live. I shall live. Then you will not leave me, Albert? Mother, I must go, said Albert in a firm, calm voice. You love me too well to wish me to remain useless and idle with you. Besides, I have signed. You will obey your own wish and the will of heaven. Not my own wish, mother, but reason, necessity. Are we not two despairing creatures? What is life to you? Nothing. What is life to me? Very little without you, mother, for believe me, but for you I should have ceased to live on the day I doubted my father and renounced his name. Well, I will live if you promise me still to hope, and if you grant me the care of your future prospects, you will redouble my strength. Then I will go to the governor of Algeria. He has a royal heart and is essentially a soldier. I will tell him my gloomy story. I will beg him to turn his eyes now and then towards me, and if he keep his word and interest himself for me, in six months I shall be an officer or dead. If I am an officer, your fortune is certain, for I shall have money enough for both, and moreover a name that we shall both be proud of, since it will be our own. If I am killed, well then, mother, you can also die, and there will be an end of our misfortunes. It is well, replied Mercedes with her eloquent glance. You are right, my love. Let us prove to those who are watching our actions that we are worthy of compassion. But let us not yield to gloomy apprehensions, said the young man. I assure you we are, or rather we shall be, very happy. You are a woman at once full of spirit and resignation. I have become simple in my tastes, and am without passion, I hope. Once in service I shall be rich. Once in Monsieur Dantes' house you will be at rest. Let us strive, I beseech you, let us strive to be cheerful. Yes, let us strive, for you ought to live, and to be happy, Albert. And so our division is made, mother, said the young man, affecting ease of mind. We can now part. Come, I shall engage your passage. And you, my dear boy? I shall stay here for a few days longer. We must accustom ourselves to parting. I want recommendations and some information relative to Africa. I will join you again at Marseille. Well, be it so, let us part, said Mercedes, folding round her shoulders the only shawl she had taken away, and which accidentally happened to be a valuable black cashmere. Albert gathered up his papers hastily, rang the bell to pay the thirty francs he owed to the landlord, and offering his arm to his mother, they descended the stairs. Someone was walking down before them, and this person, hearing the rustling of a silk dress, turned around. Debray, muttered Albert. You, Monserf, replied the secretary, resting on the stairs. Curiosity had vanquished the desire of preserving his incognito, and he was recognized. It was indeed strange in this unknown spot to find the young man whose misfortunes had made so much noise in Paris. Monserf, repeated Debray. Then, noticing in the dim light the still youthful and veiled figure of Madame de Monserf, Pardon me, he added with a smile. I leave you, Albert. Albert understood his thoughts. Mother, he said, turning towards Mercedes, this is Monsieur Debray, secretary of the Minister for the Interior, once a friend of mine. How once? stammered Debray. What do you mean? I say so, Monsieur Debray, because I have no friends now, and I ought not have any. Thank you for having recognized me, sir. Debray stepped forward and cordially pressed the hand of his interlocutor. Believe me, dear Albert, he said, with all the emotion he was capable of feeling. Believe me, I feel deeply for your misfortunes, and if in any way I can serve you, I am yours. Thank you, sir, said Albert, smiling. In the midst of our misfortunes, we are still rich enough not to require assistance from anyone. We are leaving Paris, and when our journey is paid, we shall have five thousand francs left. The blood mounted in the temples of Debray, who held a million in his pocketbook, and, unimaginative as he was, he could not help reflecting that the same house had contained two women, one of whom, justly dishonored, had left it poor with one and a half million francs under her cloak, 
while the other, unjustly stricken but sublime in her misfortune, was yet rich with a few deniers. This parallel disturbed his usual politeness, the philosophy he witnessed appalled him. He muttered a few words of general civility and ran downstairs. That day the minister's clerks and the subordinates had a great deal to put up with from his ill humor, but that same night he found himself the possessor of a fine house situated on the boulevard de la Madeleine and an income of five thousand livres. The next day, just as Debray was signing the deed, that is about five o'clock in the afternoon, Madame de Morcerf, after having affectionately embraced her son, entered the coupé of the diligence which closed upon her. A man was hidden in Lafitte's banking house behind one of the little arched windows which are placed above each desk. He saw Mercedes enter the diligence, and he also saw Albert withdraw. Then he passed his hand across his forehead, which was clouded with doubt. Alas, he exclaimed, how can I restore the happiness I have taken away from these poor innocent creatures? God help me. End of chapter 106「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Recorded by Kurt Copeland « The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas » Chapter 107 – The Lion's Den One division of La Force in which the most dangerous and desperate prisoners are confined is called the Court of St. Bernard. The prisoners, in their expressive language, have named it the lion's den, probably because the captives possess teeth which frequently gnaw the bars, and sometimes the keepers also. It is a prison within a prison. The walls are double the thickness of the rest. The gratings are every day carefully examined by jailers, whose Herculean proportions and cold pitiless expression prove them to have been chosen to reign over their subjects for their superior activity and intelligence. The courtyard of this quarter is enclosed by enormous walls over which the sun glances obliquely when it deigns to penetrate into this gulf of moral and physical deformity. On this paved yard are to be seen, pacing to and fro from morning till night, pale, careworn, and haggard, like so many shadows, the men whom justice holds beneath the steel she is sharpening. There, crouched against the side of the wall which attracts and retains the most heat, they may be seen sometimes talking to one another, but more frequently alone, watching the door, which sometimes opens to call forth one from the gloomy assemblage, or to throw in another outcast from society. The court of St. Bernard has its own particular apartment for the receptions of guests. It is a long rectangle, divided by two upright gratings, placed at a distance of three feet from one another, to prevent a visitor from shaking hands with or passing anything to the prisoners. It is a wretched, damp, nay, even horrible spot, more especially when we consider the agonizing conferences which have taken place between those iron bars. And yet, frightful though this spot may be, it is looked upon as a kind of paradise by the men whose days are numbered. It is so rare for them to leave the lion's den for any other place than the barrier of St. Jacques or the galleys. In the court which we have attempted to describe, and from which a damp vapor was rising, a young man with his hands in his pockets, who had excited much curiosity among the inhabitants of the den, might be seen walking. The cut of his clothes would have made him pass for an elegant man if those clothes had not been torn to shreds. Still, they did not show signs of wear, and the fine cloth beneath the careful hands of the prisoner soon recovered its gloss and the parts which were still perfect, for the wearer tried his best to make it assume the appearance of a new coat. He bestowed the same attention upon the cambric front of his shirt, which had considerably changed in color since his entrance into the prison, and he polished his varnished boots with a corner of a handkerchief embroidered with initials surmounted by a coronet. Some of the inmates of the lion's den were watching the operations of the prisoner's toilet with considerable interest. "'See, the prince is pluming himself,' said one of the thieves. "'He's a fine-looking fellow,' said another. "'If he had only a comb and hair grease, he'd take the shine off the gentleman in white kids.' His coat looks almost new, and his boots shine like a nigger's face. It's pleasant to have such well-dressed comrades. But didn't those gendarmes behave shameful? Must have been a jealous to tear such clothes. He looks like a big bug, said another, dressed as in fine style. And then to be here so young. Oh, what larks! 
Meanwhile, the object of this hideous admiration approached the wicket against which one of the keepers was leaning. "'Come, sir,' he said, "'lend me twenty francs. You'll soon be paid. You run no risk with me. Remember, I have relations who possess more millions than you have deniers. Come, I beseech you, lend me twenty francs, so that I may buy a dressing gown. It is intolerable always to be in a coat and boots. And what a coat, sir, for a prince of a cavalcanti. The keeper turned his back and shrugged his shoulders. He did not even laugh at what would have caused anyone else to do so. He had heard so many utter the same things. Indeed, he heard nothing else. Come, said André, you're a man void of compassion. I'll have you turned out. This made the keeper turn around, and he burst into a loud laugh. The prisoners then approached and formed a circle. I tell you that with that wretched sum, continued André, I could obtain a coat and a room in which to receive the illustrious visitor I am daily expecting. Of course, of course, said the prisoners. Anyone can see he's a gentleman. Well, then lend him the twenty francs, said the keeper, leaning on the other shoulder. Surely you will not refuse a comrade. I am no comrade of these people, said the young man, proudly. You have no right to insult me thus. The thieves looked over at one another with low murmurs, and a storm gathered over the head of the aristocratic prisoner, raised less by his own words than by the manner of the keeper. The latter, sure of quelling the tempest when the waves became too violent, allowed them to rise to a certain pitch that he might be revenged on the importunate André, and beside it would afford him some recreation during the long day. The thieves had already approached André, some screaming, La savat! La savat! a cruel operation, which consists in cuffing a comrade who may have fallen into disgrace, not with an old shoe, but with an iron-heeled one. Other proposed the anguille, another kind of recreation, in which a handkerchief is filled with sand, pebbles, and two sous pieces, when they have them, which the wretches beat like a flail over the head and shoulders of the unhappy sufferer. Let us horsewhip the fine gentleman, said others. But André, turning towards them, winked his eyes, rolled his tongue around his cheeks, and smacked his lips in a manner equivalent to a hundred words among the bandits when forced to be silent. It was a Masonic sign Caderousse had taught him. He was immediately recognized as one of them. The handkerchief was thrown down, and the iron-heeled shoe replaced on the foot of the wretch to whom it belonged. Some voices were heard to say that the gentleman was right, that he intended to be civil in his way, and that they would set the example of liberty of conscience, and the mob retired. The keeper was so stupefied at this scene that he took André by the hands and began examining his person, attributing the sudden submission of the inmates of the lion's den to something more substantial than mere fascination. André made no resistance, although he protested against it. Suddenly a voice was heard at the wicket. Benedetto! exclaimed an inspector. The keeper relaxed his hold. I am called, said André. To the visitor's room, said the same voice. You see, someone pays me a visit. "'Ah, oh, my dear sir, you will see whether a Calvacante is to be treated like a common person.' And André, gliding through the court like a black shadow, rushed out through the wicket, leaving his comrades, and even the keeper, lost in wonder. Certainly a call to the visitor's room had scarcely astonished André less than themselves, for the wily youth, instead of making use of his privilege of waiting to be claimed on his entry into La Force, had maintained a rigid silence. "'Everything,' he said, "'proves to me to be under the protection of some powerful person, "'this sudden fortune, the facility with which I have overcome all obstacles, "'an unexpected family and an illustrious name awarded to me, "'gold showered down upon me, "'and the most splendid alliance is about to be entered into. "'An unhappy lapse of fortune and an absence of my protector "'have cast me down, certainly, but not forever. "'The hand which has retreated for a while "'will be again stretched forth to save me "'at the very moment when I shall think myself sinking into the abyss.' Why should I risk an impudent step? It might alienate my protector. He has two means of extricating me from this dilemma. The one by a mysterious escape, managed through bribery, the other by buying off my judges with gold. I will say and do nothing until I am convinced that he has quite abandoned me. And then... André had formed a plan which was tolerably clever. The unfortunate youth was intrepid in the attack and rude in the defense. He had borne with a public prison and with privations of all sorts. Still, by degrees nature, or rather custom, had prevailed, and he suffered from being naked, dirty, and hungry. It was at this moment of discomfort that the inspector's voice called him to the visiting room. André felt his heart leap with joy. It was too soon for a visit from the examining magistrate, and too late for one from the director of the prison, or the doctor. It must, then, be the visitor he hoped for. Behind the grating of his room, into which André had been led, he saw, while his eyes dilated with surprise, the dark and intelligent face of Monsieur Bertuccio, 
who was also gazing with sad astonishment upon the iron bars, the bolted doors, and the shadow which moved behind the other grating. Ah, said Andre, deeply affected. Good morning, Benedetto, said Bertuccio, with a deep, hollow voice. You, you, said the young man, looking fearfully around him. Do you not recognize me, unhappy child? Silence. Be silent, said Andre, who knew the delicate sense of hearing possessed by the walls. For heaven's sake, do not speak so loud. You wish to speak to me alone, do you not, said Bertuccio? Oh, yes. That is well, and Bertuccio, feeling in his pocket, signed to a keeper whom he saw through the window of the wicket. Red, he said. What is that? asked Andre. In order to conduct you to a room and to leave you there to talk to me. Oh, cried Andre, leaping with joy. Then he mentally added, Still, my unknown protector, I am not forgotten. They wish for secrecy, since we are here to converse in private room. I understand Bertuccio has been sent by my protector. The keeper spoke for a moment with an official, then opened the iron gates and conducted Andre to a room on the first floor. The room was whitewashed, as is the custom in prisons, but it looked quite brilliant to a prisoner, though a stove, a bed, a chair, and a table formed the whole of its sumptuous furniture. Bertuccio sat down on the chair, Andre threw himself on the bed, the keeper retired. Now, said the steward, what have you to tell me? And you, said Andre, you speak first. Oh, no, you must have much to tell me since you have come to seek me. Well, be it so, you have continued your course of villainy. You have robbed, you have assassinated. Well, I should say, if you had me taken to a private room only to tell me this, you might have saved yourself the trouble. I know all these things, but there are some with which, on the contrary, I am not acquainted. Let us talk of those, if you please. Who sent you? Come, come, you're going on quickly, Monsieur Benedetto. Yes, and to the point, let us dispense with useless words. Who sends you? No one. How did you know I was in prison? I recognized you some time since as the insolent dandy who so gracefully mounted his horse in the Champs Elysees. Oh, the Champs Elysees. Ah, yes, we burn, as they say at the game of Hinciette. The Champs Elysees. Come, let us talk a little about my father. Who, then, am I? You, sir? You are my adopted father, but it was not you, I presume, who placed at my disposal a hundred thousand francs, which I spent in four or five months. It was not you who manufactured an Italian gentleman for my father. It was not you who introduced me into a world and had me invited to a certain dinner at Atur, which I fancy I am eating at this moment, in company with the most distinguished people in Paris, amongst the rest with a certain procurer, whose acquaintance I did very wrong not to cultivate, for he would have been very useful to me just now. It was not you, in fact, who bailed me for one or two millions when the fatal discovery of my little secret took place. Come, speak, my worthy Corsican, speak! What do you wish me to say? I will help you. You were speaking of the Champs Elysees just now, worthy foster father. Well? Well, in the Champs Elysees there resides a very rich gentleman. At whose house you robbed and murdered, did you not? I believe I did. The Count of Monte Cristo? "'Tis you who have named him, as Monsieur Racine says. "'Well, am I to rush into his arms and strain him to my heart, "'crying, My father, my father, like Monsieur Pissicourt? "'Do not let us jest,' gravely replied Bertuccio, "'and dare not to utter that name again as you have pronounced it.' "'Bah!' said André, a little overcome by the solemnity of Bertuccio's manner. "'Why not?' "'Because the person who bears it is too highly favoured in heaven "'to be the father of such a wretch as you.' Oh, these are fine words. And there will be fine doings if you do not take care. Menaces, I do not fear them, I will say. Do you not think you are engaged with a pygmy like yourself, said Bertuccio in a so calm tone, and with so steadfast a look that André was moved to the very soul? Do you think you have to do with galley slaves or novices in the world? Benedetto, you are fallen into terrible hands. They are ready to open for you. Make use of them. Do not play with the thunderbolt they have laid aside for a moment, but which they can take up again instantly, if you attempt to intercept their movements. My father! I will know who my father is, said the obstinate youth. I will perish if I must, but I will know it. What does scandal signify to me? What possessions, what reputation, what pull, as Beauchamp says, have I? You great people always lose something by scandal, notwithstanding your millions. Come, who is my father? I came to tell you. Ah! cried Benedetto, his eyes sparkling with joy. Just then the door opened, and the jailer, addressing himself to Bertuccio, said, 
Excuse me, sir, but the examining magistrate is waiting for the prisoner. And so closes our interview, said Andre to the worthy steward. I wish the troublesome fellow were at the devil. I will return to-morrow, said Bertuccio. Good. Gendarmes, I am at your service. Ah, sir, do leave a few crowns for me at the gate, that I may have some things I am in need of. It shall be done, replied Bertuccio. Andre extended his hand. Bertuccio kept his own in his pocket, and merely jingled a few pieces of money. "'That's what I mean,' said André, endeavouring to smile, quite overcome by the strange tranquillity of Bertuccio. "'Can I be deceived?' he murmured, as he stepped into the oblong and graded vehicle which they call the salad basket. "'Never mind, we shall see. "'Tomorrow, then,' he added, turning towards Bertuccio. "'Tomorrow,' replied the steward. End of chapter 107「私たちは私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、私たちの名前を知っているので、And that the old man and the priest were the sole guardians of the young girl's body. Perhaps it was the Christian exhortations of the abbey, perhaps his kind charity, perhaps his persuasive words which had restored the courage of Noirtier, for ever since he had conversed with the priest, his violent despair had yielded to a calm resignation which surprised all who knew his excessive affection for Valentine. Monsieur de Villefort had not seen his father since the morning of the death. The whole establishment had been changed. Another valet was engaged for himself, a new servant for Noirtier. Two women had entered Madame de Villefort's service. In fact, everywhere, to the concierge and coachman, new faces were presented to the different masters of the house, thus widening the division which had always existed between the members of the same family. The assizes also were about to begin. And Villefort, shut up in his room, exerted himself with feverish anxiety in drawing up the case against the murderer of Caderousse. This affair, like all those in which the Count of Monte Cristo had interfered, caused a great sensation in Paris. The proofs were certainly not convincing, since they rested upon a few words written by an escaped galley slave on his deathbed. And who might have been actuated by hatred or revenge in accusing his companion. But the mind of the procurer was made up. He felt assured that Benedetto was guilty, and he hoped by his skill in conducting this aggravated case to flatter his self love, which was about the only vulnerable point left in his frozen heart. The case was therefore prepared owing to the incessant labour of Villefort, who wished it to be the first on the list in the coming assizes. He had been obliged to seclude himself more than ever, to evade the enormous number of applications presented to him for the purpose of obtaining tickets of admission to the court on the day of the trial. And then so short a time had elapsed since the death of poor Valentine, and the gloom which overshadowed the house was so recent that no one wondered to see the father so absorbed in his professional duties. Which were the only means he had of dissipating his grief. Only once had Villefort seen his father. It was the day after that upon which Bertuccio had paid his second visit to Benedetto, when the latter was to learn his father's name. The magistrate, harassed and fatigued, had descended to the garden of his house, and in a gloomy mood similar to that in which Tarquin lopped off the tallest poppies, He began knocking off with his cane the long and dying branches of the rose trees, which placed along the avenue seemed like the spectres of the brilliant flowers which had bloomed in the past season. More than once he had reached that part of the garden where the famous bordered gate stood overlooking the deserted enclosure, always returning by the same path, to begin his walk again at the same pace and with the same gesture. When he accidentally turned his eyes towards the house, whence he heard the noisy play of his son, who had returned from school to spend the Sunday and Monday with his mother. 
While doing so, he observed Monsieur Nautier at one of the open windows where the old man had been placed that he might enjoy the last rays of the sun which yet yielded some heat, and was now shining upon the dying flowers and red leaves of the creeper which twined around the balcony. The eye of the old man was riveted upon a spot which Willifort could scarcely distinguish. His glance was so full of hate, of ferocity, and savage impatience that Villefort turned out of the path he had been pursuing to see upon what person this dark look was directed. Then he saw beneath a thick clump of linden trees, which were neatly divested of foliage, Madame de Villefort sitting with a book in her hand, the perusal of which she frequently interrupted to smile upon her son, or to throw back his elastic ball, which he obstinately threw from the drawing-room into the garden. Villefort became pale. He understood the old man's meaning. Noirtier continued to look at the same object, but suddenly his glance was transferred from the wife to the husband, and Villefort himself had to submit to the searching investigation of eyes, which, while changing their direction and even their language, had lost none of their menacing expression. Madame de Villefort, unconscious of the passions that exhausted their fire over her head, at that moment held her son's ball, and was making signs to him to reclaim it with a kiss. Edward begged for a long while, the maternal kiss probably not offering sufficient recompense for the trouble he must take to obtain it. However, at length, he decided, leaped out of the window into a cluster of heliotropes and daisies, and ran to his mother, his forehead streaming with perspiration. Madame de Villefort wiped his forehead, pressed her lips upon it, and sent him back with a ball in one hand and some bonbons in the other. Villefort, drawn by an irresistible attraction, like that of the bird to the serpent, walked towards the house. As he approached it, Noirtier's gaze followed him, and his eyes appeared of such a fiery brightness that Villefort felt them pierced to the depth of his heart. In that earnest look might be read a deep reproach, as well as a terrible menace. Then Noirtier raised his eyes to heaven, as though to remind his son of a forgotten oath. "'It is well, sir,' replied Villefort from below. "'It is well. Have patience, but one day longer. What I have said, I will do.' Noirtier seemed to be calmed by these words and turned his eyes with indifference to the other side. Villefort violently unbuttoned his great coat, which seemed to strangle him, and passing his livid hand across his forehead, entered his study. The night was cold and still. The family had all retired to rest, but Villefort, who alone remained up, worked till five o'clock in the morning, reviewing the last interrogatories, made the night before by the examining magistrates compiling the depositions of the witnesses and putting the finishing stroke to the deed of accusation, which was one of the most energetic and best conceived of any he had yet delivered. The next day, Monday, was the first sitting of the Assizes. The morning dawned dull and gloomy, and Villefort saw the dim grey light shine upon the lines he had traced in red ink. The magistrate had slept for a short time, while the lamp sent forth its final struggles. Its flickerings awoke him, and he found his fingers as damp and purple as though they had been dipped in blood. He opened the window, a bright yellow streak crossed the sky and seemed to divide in half the poplars, which stood out in black relief on the horizon. In the clover fields beyond the chestnut trees, a lark was mounting up to heaven, while pouring out her clear morning song. The damps of the dew bathed the head of Willifor and refreshed his memory. Today, he said with an effort, today the man who holds the blade of justice must strike wherever there is guilt. Involuntarily, his eyes wandered towards the window of Noirtier's room, where he had seen him the preceding night. The curtain was drawn, and yet the image of his father was so vivid to his mind that he addressed the closed window as though it had been open, and as if through the opening he had beheld the menacing old man. Yes, he murmured. Yes, 
be satisfied. His head dropped upon his chest, and in this position he paced his study. Then he threw himself, dressed as he was, upon a sofa, less to sleep than to rest his limbs, cramped with cold and study. By degrees every one awoke. Willifor, from his study, heard the successive noises which accompany the life of a house, the opening and shutting of doors, the ringing of Madame de Villefort's bell to summon the wanting maid, mingled with the first shouts of the child, who rose full to the enjoyment of his age. Willifor also rang. His new valet brought him the papers, and with them a cup of chocolate. "'What are you bringing me?' said he. "'A cup of chocolate.' I did not ask for it. Who has paid me this attention? My mistress, sir. She said you would have to speak a great deal in the murder case, and that you should take something to keep up your strength. And the valet placed the cup on the table nearest to the sofa, which was, like all the rest, covered with papers. The valet then left the room. Villefort looked for an instant with a gloomy expression. Then, suddenly, taking it up with a nervous motion, he swallowed its contents at one draught. It might have been thought that he hoped the beverage would be mortal, and that he sought for death to deliver him from a duty which he would rather die than fulfil. He then rose and paced his room with a smile it would have been terrible to witness. The chocolate was inoffensive, for Monsieur de Villefort felt no effects, the breakfast hour arrived, but Monsieur de Villefort was not at table. The valet re-entered. Madame de Villefort wishes to remind you, sir, he said, that eleven o'clock has just struck, and that the trial commences at twelve. Well, said Villefort, what then? Madame de Villefort is dressed. She is quite ready and wishes to know if she is to accompany you, sir. Where to? To the palais. What to do? My mistress wishes much to be present at the trial. Ah, said Villefort, with a startling accent. Does she wish that? The man drew back and said, If you wish to go alone, sir, I will go and tell my mistress. Villefort remained silent for a moment, and dented his pale cheeks with his nails. "'Tell your mistress,' he said at length, "'that I wish to speak to her, "'and I beg she will wait for me in her own room.' "'Yes, sir. "'Then come to dress and shave me.' "'Directly, sir.' "'The valet reappeared almost instantly, "'and having shaved his master, "'assisted him to dress entirely in black. "'When he had finished, he said,' My mistress said she should expect you, sir, as soon as you had finished dressing. I am going to her. And Villefort, with his papers under his arm and hat in hand, directed his steps towards the apartment of his wife. At the door he paused for a moment to wipe his damp, pale brow. He then entered the room. Madame de Villefort was sitting on, on an ottoman and impatiently turning over the leaves of some newspapers and pamphlets which young Edward, by way of amusing himself, was tearing to pieces before his mother could finish reading them. She was dressed to go out. Her bonnet was placed beside her on a chair, and her gloves were on her hands. "'Ah, here you are, monsieur,' she said in her naturally calm voice. "'But how pale you are!' Have you been working all night? Why did you not come down to breakfast? Well, will you take me, or shall I take Edward? Madame de Villefort had multiplied her questions in order to gain one answer, but to all her inquiries, Monsieur de Villefort remained mute and cold as a statue. Edward, said Villefort, fixing an imperious glance on the child. Go and play in the drawing room, my dear. I wish to speak to your mamma. Madame de Villefort shuddered at the sight of that cold countenance, that resolute tone, and the awfully strange preliminaries. Edward raised his head, looked at his mother, and then finding that she did not confirm the order, began cutting off the heads of his leaden soldiers. Edward! cried Monsieur de Villefort so harshly 
that the child started up from the floor. Do you hear me? Go! The child, unaccustomed to such treatment, arose, pale and trembling. It would be difficult to say whether his emotion were caused by fear or passion. His father went up to him, took him in his arms and kissed his forehead. Go, he said. Go, my child. Edward ran out. Monsieur de Villefort went to the door which he closed behind the child and bolted. Dear me, said the young woman, endeavouring to read her husband's inmost thoughts, while a smile passed over her countenance which froze the impassibility of Villefort. What is the matter? Madame, where do you keep the poison you generally use? said the magistrate without any introduction placing himself between his wife and the door. Madame de Villefort must have experienced something of the sensation of a bird which, looking up, sees the murderous trap closing over its head. A hoarse, broken tone, which was neither a cry nor a sigh, escaped from her, while she became deadly pale. Monsieur, she said, I, I do not understand you and in her first paroxysm of terror, she had raised herself from the sofa. In the next, stronger very likely than the other, she fell down again on the cushions. I asked you, continued Villefort, in a perfectly calm tone, where you conceal the poison by the aid of which you have killed my father-in-law, Monsieur de saint Merin, my mother-in-law, Madame de saint Merin, Barrois, and my daughter Valentine. Ah, oh, sir, exclaimed Madame de Villefort, clasping her hands, what do you say? It is not for you to interrogate, but to answer. Is it to the judge or to the husband? stammered Madame de Villefort. To the judge, to the judge, Madame. It was terrible to behold the frightful pallor of the woman, the anguish of her look, the trembling of her whole frame. Ah, oh, sir, she muttered. Ah, oh, sir! And this was all. You do not answer, madame, exclaimed the terrible interrogator. Then he added, with a smile yet more terrible than his anger, It is true, then. You do not deny it? She moved forward. And you cannot deny it, added Villefort, extending his hand towards her, as though to seize her in the name of justice. You have accomplished these different crimes with impudent address, but which could only deceive those whose affections for you blinded them. Since the death of Madame de saint Marin, I have known that a poisoner lived in my house. Monsieur de Avrigny warned me of it. After the death of Barrois, my suspicions were directed towards an angel. Those suspicions which, even when there is no crime, are always alive in my heart. But after the death of Valentine, there has been no doubt in my mind, madame, and not only in mine, but in those of others. Thus your crime, known by two persons, suspected by many, will soon become public. And, as I told you just now, you no longer speak to the husband, but to the judge. The young woman hid her face in her hands. Oh, sir, she stammered. I beseech you, do not believe appearances. Are you then a coward? cried Villefort in a contemptuous voice. But I have always observed that poisoners were cowards. Can you be a coward? You, who have had the courage to witness the death of two old men and a young girl murdered by you? Sir, sir! Can you be a coward? continued Villefort with increasing excitement. You, who could count one by one the minutes of four death agonies? You, who have arranged your infernal plans and removed the beverages with a talent and precision almost miraculous? Have you then, who have calculated everything with such nicety, have you forgotten to calculate one thing? I mean where the revelation of your crimes will lead you to. Oh, it is impossible! You must have saved some surer, more subtler and deadly poison than any other, that you might escape the punishment that you deserve. You have done this. I hope so, at least. 
Madame de Villefort stretched out her hands and fell on her knees. I understand, he said. You confess, but a confession made to the judges, a confession made at the last moment, extorted when the crime cannot be denied, diminishes not the punishment inflicted on the guilty. The punishment? exclaimed Madame de Villefort. The punishment, monsieur? Twice you have pronounced that word. Certainly. Did you hope to escape it because you were four times guilty? Did you think the punishment would be withheld because you are the wife of him who pronounces it? No, madame, no. The scaffold awaits the poisoner. Whoever she may be, unless, as I just said, the poisoner has taken the precaution of keeping for herself a few drops of her deadliest poison. Madame de Villefort uttered a wild cry and a hideous and uncontrollable terror spread over her distorted features. Oh, do not fear the scaffold, madame, said the magistrate. I will not dishonour you, since that would be dishonour to myself. No, if you have heard me distinctly, you will understand that you are not to die on the scaffold. No, I do not understand what you mean, stammered the unhappy woman, completely overwhelmed. I mean that the wife of the first magistrate in the capital shall not, by her infamy, soil an unblemished name, that she shall not, with her one blow, dishonour her husband and her child. No, no, oh no! Well, madame, it will be a laudable action on your part, and I will thank you for it. You will thank me? For what? For what you have just said. What did I just say? Oh, my brain whirls! I no longer understand anything. Oh, my God, my God! And she rose with her hair dishevelled and her lips foaming. Have you answered the question I put to you on entering the room? Where do you keep the poison you generally use, madame? Madame de Villefort raised her arms to heaven and convulsively struck one hand against the other. No, no, she vociferated. No, you cannot wish that. What I do not wish, madame, is that you should perish on the scaffold. Do you understand? asked Villefort. Oh, mercy, mercy, monsieur. What I require is that justice be done. I am on the earth to punish, madame, he added, with a flaming glance. Any other woman, were it the queen herself, I would send to the executioner. But to you I shall be merciful. To you I will say, Have you not, madame, put aside some of the surest, deadliest, most speedy poison? Oh, pardon me, sir, let me live. She is cowardly, said Villefort. Reflect that I am your wife. You are a poisoner. In the name of heaven. No, in the name of the love you once bore me. No, no, in the name of our child. Ah, for the sake of our child, let me live. No, 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 I tell you, one day, if I allow you to live, you will perhaps kill him as you have the others. I, I kill my boy, cried the distracted mother, rushing towards Willifor. I kill my son? <laughs> and a frightful, demoniac laugh filled the sentence, which was lost in a hoarse rattle. Madame de Villefort fell at her husband's feet. He approached her. Think of it, madame, he said. If on my return justice has not been satisfied, I will denounce you with my own mouth and arrest you with my own hands. She listened, panting, overwhelmed, crushed. Her eye alone lived and glared horribly. Do you understand me? he said. I am going down there to pronounce the sentence of death against a murderer. If I find you alive on my return, you shall sleep tonight in the conciergerie. Madame de Villefort sighed. Her nerves gave away and she sunk on the carpet. The king's attorney seemed to experience a sensation of pity. He looked upon her less severely and bowing to her, said slowly, Farewell, madame, farewell. That farewell struck Madame de Villefort like the executioner's knife. She fainted. The procurer went out after having double-locked the door.
End of chapter 108
like a very bloodhound of heraldry. Then you never believed in the Principality? Yes, in the Principality, but not in the Prince. Not so bad, said Bouchon. Still, I assure you, he passed very well with many people. I saw him at the minister's houses. Ah, yes, said Chateau The idea of thinking ministers understand anything about princes? There is something in what you have just said, said Bouchon, laughing. But, said de Bré to Bouchon, if I spoke to the president, you must have been with the procureur. It was an impossibility. For the last week, Monsieur de Villefort has secluded himself. It is natural enough. This strange chain of domestic afflictions, followed by the no less strange death of his daughter. Strange? What do you mean, Bouchon? Oh, yes, do you pretend that all this has been unobserved at the minister, said Bouchon, placing his eyeglass in his eye, where he tried to make it remain. My dear sir, said Chateau Renaud, allow me to tell you that you do not understand that manoeuvre with the eyeglass half so well as Debray. Give him a lesson, Debray. Stay, said Bouchon, surely I am not deceived. What is it? It is she. Whom do you mean? They said she had left. Mademoiselle Eugenie, said Chateau Renaud, has she returned? No, but her mother. Madame Danglars? Nonsense. Impossible, said Chateau Renaud. Only ten days after the flight of her daughter, and three days from the bankruptcy of her husband? Debray colored slightly and followed with his eyes the direction of Beauchamp's glance. Come, he said, it is only a veiled lady, some foreign princess. Perhaps the mother of Cavalcanti. But you were just speaking on a very interesting topic, Bouchon. I? Yes, you were telling us about the extraordinary death of Valentine. Ah, yes, so I was. But how is it that Madame de Villefort is not here? Poor dear woman, said Debré. She is no doubt occupied in distilling balm for the hospitals, or in making cosmetics for herself or friends. Do you know, she spends two or three thousand crowns a year in this amusement. But I wonder she is not here. I should have been pleased to see her, for I like her very much. And I hate her, said Chateau Renaud. Why? I do not know. Why do we love? Why do we hate? I detest her from antipathy. Or rather, by instinct? Perhaps so. But to return to what you were saying, Beauchamp. Well... Do you know why they die so multitudinously at Monsieur de Villefort's? <laughs> multitudinously is good, said Chateau Renaud. My good fellow, you'll find the word in Saint-Simon. But the thing itself, said Monsieur de Villefort's. But let's get back to the subject. Talking of that, said Debray, Madame was making inquiries about that house, which for the last three months has been hung with black. Who is Madame? asked Chateau Renaud. The minister's wife, pardieu. Oh, your pardon. I never visit ministers. I leave that to the princess. Really, you were only before sparkling, but now you are brilliant. Take compassion on us, or, like Jupiter, you will wither us up. I will not speak again, said Chateau Renaud. Pray have compassion upon me. Do not take up every word I say. Come, let us endeavour to get to the end of our story, Bouchon. I told you that yesterday Madame made inquiries of me upon the subject. Enlighten me, and I will then communicate my information to her. Well, gentlemen, the reason people die so multitudinously, I like the word, at Monsieur de Villefort's is that there is an assassin in the house. The two young men shuddered, for the same idea had more than once occurred to them. And who is the assassin? they asked together. Young Edward. A burst of laughter from the auditors did not in the least disconcert the speaker, who continued. Yes, gentlemen, Edward, the infant phenomenon, who is quite an adept in the art of killing. You are jesting. Not at all. I yesterday engaged a servant, who had just left Monsieur de Villefort. I intend sending him away tomorrow, for he eats so enormously, to make up for the fast imposed upon him by his terror in that house. Well, now listen. We are listening. It appears the child has obtained possession of a bottle containing some drug, which he every now and then uses against those who have displeased him. First, Monsieur and Madame de saint Meron incurred his displeasure, so he poured out three drops of his elixir. Three drops were sufficient. Then followed Barois, the old servant of Monsieur Noirtier, 
who sometimes rebuffed this little wretch. He therefore received the same quantity of the elixir. The same happened to Valentine, of whom he was jealous. He gave her the same dose as the others, and all was over for her as well as the rest. Why, what nonsense are you telling us? said Chateau Renaud. Yes, it is an extraordinary story, said Bouchon, is it not? That is absurd, said Debray. Ah, said Bouchon, you doubt me? Well, you can ask my servant, or rather him who will no longer be my servant tomorrow. It was the talk of the house. And this elixir, where is it? What is it? The child conceals it. But where did he find it? In his mother's laboratory. Does his mother, then, keep poisons in her laboratory? How can I tell? You are questioning me like a king's attorney. I only repeat what I have been told. Unlike my informant, I can do no more. The poor devil would eat nothing from fear. It is incredible. No, my dear fellow, it is not at all incredible. You saw the child pass through the Rue Richelieu last year, who amused himself with killing his brothers and sisters by sticking pins in their ears while they slept. The generation of followers are very precocious. Come, Bouchon, said Chateau Renaud. I will bet anything you do not believe a word of all you have been telling us. I do not see the Count of Monte Cristo here. He is worn out, said Debray. Besides, he could not well appear in public, since he has been the dupe of the Cavalcanti, who, it appears, presented themselves to him with false letters of credit, and cheated him out of a hundred thousand francs upon the hypothesis of this principality. By the way, Monsieur de Chateau Renaud, asked Beauchamp, how is Morel? Ma foi, I have called three times without once seeing him. Still, his sister did not seem uneasy, and told me that though she had not seen him for two or three days, she was sure he was well. Ah, uh, now I think of it, the Count of Monte Cristo cannot appear in the hall, said Beauchamp. Why not? Because he is an actor in the drama. Has he assassinated anyone, then? No, on the contrary, they wished to assassinate him. You know that it was in leaving his house that Monsieur de Cadrousse was murdered by his friend Benedetto. You know that the famous waistcoat was found in his house, containing the letter which stopped the signature of the marriage contract. Do you see the waistcoat? There it is, all blood-stained on the desk, as a testimony of the crime. Ah, very good. Hush, gentlemen, here is the court. Let us go back to our places. A noise was heard in the hall. The sergeant called his two patrons with an energetic hum, and the doorkeeper appearing called out with that shrill voice peculiar to his order ever since the days of Beaumarchais. The court, gentlemen! End of chapter 109